afternoon. I want to take this time to welcome everyone to our November 9th, 2021 City of Little Rock Board Agenda Meeting, where we will set the agenda for the November 16th City of Little Rock Board of Directors Meeting. Uh, we'll first have a presentation uh, from our, direct, our zoo director, uh, Susan Altree, to give us a presentation on Glow Wild. Is that true? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Directors. I'm so happy to be here to share with you about our newest event at the Little Rock Zoo. And uh, you also have in front of you some gifts from the Little Rock Zoo for our Glow Wild event. That's the nice uh, blinking light in front of you. There's some treats in there for you as well as a fortune cookie. So we hope that you enjoy. If the blinking light becomes too much, it does turn off. So uh, feel free to find that switch and turn that off if it becomes too much for you. But uh, we wanted some ambiance while we were talking about Glow Wild tonight. So Glow Wild started on November the 4th and will be running through January the 15th. We have a combination of around 45 nights for this spectacular new event at the Little Rock Zoo. Uh, before we talk about Glow Wild, though, I did want to give you just a brief update on how the zoo is doing because we've really been having a banner year for the Little Rock Zoo. Uh, right now, our membership sales are the best they have ever been in the history of our program. Uh, we have more than 24,000 members to to our membership program, about 18,000 that are here in the city of Little Rock. Uh, the Little Rock Zoo has the largest membership program of any cultural attraction that's in the central Arkansas area. We're often called on by other cultural attractions uh, for best practices on how to do membership programs. We're very proud of that membership program. And this has just been a fantastic year for that membership program. Also, too, the zoo has fully recovered uh, from, uh, from COVID-19. Uh, we have uh, so far, uh, our attendance has gone up uh, about 60% from 2020, and we are up slightly from our 2019 numbers by about 3%. So we have made a full recovery from COVID-19 and uh, knock on wood that we will continue with those great attendance numbers. Also too, the zoo met its entire revenue budget by the, uh, the month of August, at the end of August. Uh, so we've been doing great revenue-wise this year. And in park spending, our per cap spending, uh, that's the amount of money that people are spending on things like concessions, uh, rides and uh, things at our gift shop, uh, that spending is also up uh, by 23%. So that's also an indication uh, that we're doing better uh, with the way that uh, we are merchandising our gift shop and doing some other things at the zoo as well. And this year we had two things happen uh, that haven't happened uh, the entire time that I've been at the zoo. And that is we sold out of our entire inventory of the gift shop twice. Uh, that happened during spring break and then later on in the year where we literally sold out of everything in our gift shop and the back stock. Uh, we had to call on a company that is called Plush in a Rush uh, to get uh, some stuffed animals uh, to run down to Dallas, get that inventory and get it back quickly. So we we could restock our gift shop. Uh, that's how popular uh, the gift shop has been this year. So uh, we're seeing a lot of popularity for the zoo this year because of that. And we also are working to continue access at the zoo. We're working with our partners at the school district to bring back our uh, program where we're allowing all third graders to come to the zoo for free, working with an education program where we work with their teachers in advance uh, to, for them to come out to the school and uh, to work with those education classes. Classroom. So increasing access is also something that we continue to do. So moving on to Glow Wild. Glow Wild is our newest event at the zoo, and we're so excited about it. This is a larger-than-life light experience. It's a new holiday light event. We're partnering with a group called Tianu Arts and Culture. Uh, it's also made possible by the Arkansas Zoological Foundation, who is helping to support this event. And our presenting partner is Keep Arkansas Beautiful. We're very grateful for their support. We have select nights, November 4th, which started last week through January the 15th. And there's more than 45 days that are spanning 10 weeks. There's lots of opportunities to come to see this event. And it's one of the most unique light events in the state of Arkansas. So what is this event? It's a lantern event. 
And just a little bit about what Tianu is and what a lantern festival is. Well, Tianu is a global leading producer of lantern events, and it stems from the idea of a Chinese New Year celebration. These lanterns come in all shapes and sizes, and Tianu has worked with us and worked with dozens of other zoos across the United States, other botanical gardens as well. We did a lot of research in finding this partner uh, and found that there were a lot of successful events and a lot of zoos having successful events like this. But what's so great is that they partnered with us and helped us to come up with a custom created event just for the Little Rock Zoo. So this event is unique to our area, unique to our animals, and unique to our zoo, and they've just been fantastic partners for us. And they've also added a conservation theme for our show, which we think is just fantastic to have that educational element. The lanterns are all inspired by nature, and they are just simply dramatic and gorgeous. It really truly is nature illuminated, and we have those custom designs. There's about 30 of them that are all over the zoo, and other lights that are also added. We also have interactive features. Uh, we have a piano that uh, the kids can jump on, and as they jump on that piano, it lights up, uh, and it's a lot of fun for the kids. And we also have other lanterns that are placed around the zoo pathway. We have an international market uh, where you can purchase gifts, uh, as well as food and beverage options, and also, of course, the carousel and train will be open during our Glow Wild event. And these are just some of the pictures of uh, just how beautiful this event is. Uh, you can just see how dramatic and gorgeous they are when they're lit up. And they're even beautiful during the day, too. Uh, that's one of my favorites, the peacock. This is at our front entrance. And you can see that walkway there as you walk through, just how dramatic it is uh, when you come through the zoo and see some of these lanterns. We have a panda garden and a very large octopus, so there's lots of variety in what you see. And that's a little map that shows you that the lanterns are all along the pathway at the zoo, so it really truly is an experience for you to walk and see and experience. And we have engagement, so this is um, some large angel wings where you can take pictures, so we have ways for people to also engage with the lanterns. Some of our sponsors, we have quite a few sponsors that have helped to make this possible, and so we're very grateful for those sponsors. And uh, that's something that we're very proud of at the Little Rock Zoo, is that we do have quite a few corporate sponsors that help to make things possible. Uh, we're very grateful for all of them. And I thank you so much for your time. Happy to take any questions and hope that you're able to come out for our VIP night, which is Thursday from 6 to 8 o'clock at the zoo in Cafe Africa. We'll have beverages and uh, food. And of course, you'll be able to see the Glow Wild event. If you can't make it out on Thursday, if you'd like to come out any other night, we would love to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Director Altrui. We really do appreciate your leadership uh, with the Little Rock Zoo. Seeing no questions from members of the board. We'll now uh, transition and ask our chief financial officer, Sarah Linehan, to approach uh, to present um, the proposed budget um, for 2022. And as um, Director Linehan approaches uh, to give uh, the proposed budget, I just want to take this time to, while we share with the members of the board last week, last Friday, uh, Director Linehan was recognized uh, as Arkansas Businesses Public Sector CFO of the Year. Uh, we're so grateful uh, for your hard work, your servant leadership, and financial expertise that you've shared uh, with the city of Little Rock. Uh, we're grateful that not only that your peers, but many other financial experts recognize your talent. And also, as I know you would say, also your team uh, that allows you to lead the way that you lead and keeping um, our budget balance, our bond rating with great uh, approval rates uh, from that standpoint. And wanted to take this opportunity and just give you a round of applause. And uh, before uh, you present, um, I do want to ask board members to brace themselves. Uh, this could be a lengthy presentation, uh, so just want to give you all a heads up. Um, the intent is for us to go through both the revenues and expenditures um, 
there are a few things that are part of the process, as you all are aware, uh, that also guide the budgeting process that Director Linhan will share, but just want to make sure you know it's, it's going to be a lengthy process in regards to this presentation. But again, I want to take time um, to recognize her team that has worked endless hours with uh, City Manager Moore and myself as we co-proposed this budget together uh, for the City uh, Board of Directors approval. And, but I do know the finance team has been working around the clock for many weeks uh, to get us to this point. Uh, we're grateful for you and the team. Thank you very much, Mayor. And um, I appreciate the recognition of the team. And um, I want to recognize Keisha Gansky, too. She's our special operations manager back here who has responsibility for the budget office and internal audit. Keisha, and if you don't mind standing, just so I know many times members of the board may not get a chance to see. So um, she has been great support in this process and um, is an integral part of it. So thank you. Um, first, um, as we begin to go through the budget information, I wanted to provide a little bit of background information. So um, there are some needs that are not included in the up upcoming budget presentation that may be addressed with other funding sources if desired by the Board of Directors. So as you all are aware, the 3 8 cent tax for capital projects expires at the end of this year, which eliminates um, one of the major sources we've had for capital funding. In addition, our street and drainage bonds will be retired in April of 2022. All of the proceeds of those bonds, the board has already approved the round of projects and all the final three-year round of projects that's included with those bonds. Um, if uh, we wanted to renew those bonds or, or uh, continue the millage beyond 2022, there would have to be a re uh, an election in 22 to authorize issuance of additional bonds and to renew the three mil levy. Otherwise, that will expire at the end of 2022. On the next slide, we have... Um, the second tranche of the American Rescue Plan Act funding is expected to be received in May 2022. And then the only uh, debt that the city can issue without going to voters for approval would be either revenue bonds secured by um, the revenues of a facility such as waste disposal um, or short-term financing notes and those we have traditionally issued um, they must be repaid with general revenues only general fund revenues and they can be outstanding for no more than five years um, and they're only allowed for capital expenditures and then we have grant funds and we have forfeiture funds so during the budget process um, as we met with departments and gathered information on things that they desired. Um, we marked, kind of earmarked things that might potentially be uh, available under the second tranche of the American Rescue Plan Act. So some of those things include uh, $2.9 million for ve fire vehicle replacements. Um, while we had completed our three-year uh, funding scope for the second set of turnouts, Fire had more uh, retirements than they had anticipated, and they had identified a need for an additional 55 sets at $2,100 each, and so they've asked for another 126000 As new recruit classes come on, they have that covered in their uniform budget. Um, the police department uh, has asked for 65000 for a Faro 3D laser scanner for the Major Crimes Division and 138,000 for uh, patrol cameras for the vehicles. Information technology has requested 125,000 for security. It's new network enclosures to secure remote network locations and uh, 200,000 for servers to support exchange 2019 upgrade. Now the annual operating expense that would be associated with the exchange upgrade is included in the operating budget. This is just the capital portion for the servers. And then parks and recreation and golf have requested 450,000 for playground equipment for uh, Kiwanis and Morehart Parks, More, Morehart Parks and 50,000 um, to round out the funding for the 
Rebsamen Hole, uh, Golf Hole 13 relocation. This particular hole is kind of sliding off into the river, and so they have a need to relocate it. And then 75,000 for first tee expansion design. And then the zoo um, actually has a need for a million dollar stormwater upgrade. Um, this is to address some EPA concerns and um, it would be a, a perfect qualifier for the American Rescue Plan. And then finance needs 185,000 for budget software solution. Now, in addition from our existing ARPA administrative allocation that the board has already approved, um, we're going to add an accounting clerk. It's a limited service position at a cost of 41,265 to address some of the additional uh, expenditure and documentation needs. And then um, there's some grants and procurement operations and equipment of 35,000. And then information technology finance grants and procurement would have um, some professional education regarding compliance with ARPA guidelines and procurement requirements. And then uh, security is a big issue and security training for the network security analyst, data center administrator, and security training for additional staff would be about 70,500. 70, now, of course, in order to um, allocate any, any additional funds from the second tranche, we'll be coming back to the board with a proposal. Also, you'll notice that most of the items that were listed would be considered in that lost revenue category, um, with the exception of some of the IT security and the um, the stormwater project. But when we uh, did our calculations for lost revenue, um, the, the coverage should be sufficient to encompass these items. So um, the other sources of funding that I mentioned were some forfeiture funds and some other grants. So um, we have forfeiture funds that would be available to police. They need um, to replace 175 Apex 6000 radios at a cost of $1.1 million. Um, they are in the process of kind of uh, updating the hangar building um, to provide remote storage for the property room, and they want to put a gun vault out there at a cost of 30000 and then replacement of some ballistic vests of 85,000. And it would be anticipated that those would come first from forfeiture funds, and then if necessary, um, additional grants. Training, um, this is police training as well. They uh, have asked for an additional 200,000 um, that they believe they could access from the burn grant for various training opportunities. And then um, to replace lost funding due to the federal reductions for the Stop Violence Against Women Act, which is the VAWA, and uh, Victims of Crime Act, VOCA, um, $165,000. And we would draw that potentially either from the community violence allocation or from PIT carryover funds. We have a lot of fleet replacement needs and there are very limited funds available um, from auction sales of old equipment and vehicles, but that does produce some funding annually. The operating budget will provide for lease payments on patrol and other vehicles that were delivered. These are vehicles we already have. They were delivered between 2019 to 2021, but it does not provide for additional fleet purchases beyond those lease payments. The short-term financing may be utilized for some vehicle purchases, but it's not appropriate for leased vehicles because we do not own the vehicles. We turn them back in order to complete, re, com, continue to refresh the fleet. Um, ultimately, we're going to need to develop a long-term plan for vehicle leases and for information technology needs. As we've discussed in the past, um, most of the inter, um, in, Information technology is now subscription-based, cloud-type based, and it does not qualify for financing under Arkansas law because it's not tangible personal property. So now we're gonna move into the operating budget. First, um, we'll go through the, the trend data on our major revenue categories as we typically do. So um, first for our property tax revenues, we um, 
are expecting those to be approximately $32.46 million, which is 0.9% below the 2021 amended budget. Now this does reflect 2.5% growth, but it's offset by those excess commissions that we received in 2021 that were associated with 2020. So the actual revenues in 2020 two um, will not have that excess commission again carried over and so they're actually expected to decline just a little bit. Our sales tax revenues, um, we've got sales tax from that comes from the, the city share of the county one cent and then the local tax. So we'll talk about the county's tax first. Um, we're projecting that to be 50.78 million um, compared to 51.05 million in 2021. Again, this is a slight decrease. Um, the state has projected a 6% decrease in the first six months of 2022, and I mentioned that um, at our last financial presentation. The primary drivers for the state forecasted decrease, I think, are the changes the legislature made to um, the tax on vehicles. They raised the, the threshold before vehicles are taxable. And then also the um, reduction of the state grocery tax. Now, neither of those have a tremendous impact on the city. Um, the city already receives very little for vehicle sales because of that threshold and only the first 2,500 is, is taxable. Um, and then the grocery taxes were not impacted for municipalities across the state um, by the legislature. Uh, but the reason that we're not projecting an increase, first of all, we had unusual revenues, as you're aware, in 2021 that included about, um, well, I, I know over a million four in total in that ferro alloy steel manufacturing category that we do not anticipate repeating in 2022. In addition, um, there was a tremendous amount of stimulus money distributed in 2021, both to individuals and businesses that um, increased spending and that is not expected to reoccur next year. So with our city tax, um, really same song, second verse to some extent, and I've already gone through um, some of the reasons that we're not projecting an increase. Um, the, the sentiment is that 2021 was an unusual spending year, and so we want to be cautious by not projecting an increase, but we're not going so far as to project a decrease like the state is given the, the difference in our revenue sources. So with the city local tax, we're expecting 65.9 million um, compared to 65.96 in 2021. Our franchise fees, um, we are expecting uh, revenues of 30.37 million, which is an increase of 2.6% or 768,000 over 2021. This is a combination of increases in Intergy, which the utilities provide the forecast to us directly. Um, we receive the forecast from Energy, which reflects an increase. Uh, Centerpoint, you may have seen in the news with the snowstorm, they've already gone to the PSC and have received an, an increase um, for some of the gas costs, and, and they're expecting the winter bills could be as much as 30% above prior year. Um, but Little Rock Water Reclamation and Central Arkansas Water are projecting decreases. Last year during the snowstorm, people kept their faucets dripping, which increased water revenues. It also increased the winter uh, water usage rate that's used in the waste, uh, the sewer bills. Both are projecting decreases. Uh, Center Point, or excuse me, Central Arkansas Water was projecting a 2% decrease. Uh, Water Reclamation Authority is projecting a 6% decrease. So the cumulative effect of all that is a 2.6% increase in our franchise fees. Charges for services, we're expecting to increase 4% over the 2021 budget to 11.26 million. Um, we've looked at all the individual categories and as Susan just mentioned, 
The zoo and golf revenues recovered beautifully in 2021, being an outdoor activity where social distancing was able to be accomplished. That was a place where people flocked and they've had record revenues in 2021. Um, however, the River Market, Jim Daly Fitness Aquatics were much slower to reopen to the public. Um, and so those revenues have remained very depressed in 2021. We're expecting to see a 92% increase in river market revenues, which is $180,000, and a 73% increase in Jim Daly Fitness revenues, which is $106,000. Uh, and then our park revenues um, are also trailing uh, because the community centers, the summer activities were not able to be held, and we're expecting those to resume next year, which will increase those about 14.5%. Um, the reimbursement from the uh, 911 fees that's helped to support the 911 operations and our reimbursements from the airport for security for police and fire and, and those services are expected to be consistent with the prior year. So overall, again, a 4% increase in charges for services. For our business licenses, <clears throat> we're expecting this revenue to be pretty flat, um, 7.2 million. Uh, there are no rate changes reflected in the budget and um, business license renewals uh, continue to be pretty steady. We have seen um, some businesses close as a result of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, but we've also seen new businesses start up. Our mixed drink licenses um, have recovered uh, since the decline in 2020, um, but they are expected, while they really have picked up second quarter through the end of the year, um, they're expected to be really consistent next year, and that's because um, we did have several businesses that closed. And so even though they have recovered, those that are in business have recovered, there are some that are no longer in business. So we're expecting that to be pretty consistent with last year's revenues. Fines and fee revenues um, are expected to uh, increase about 14.8% from the amended 2021 budget to $1.93 million. Um, COVID impacted our fines and fees as traffic was suppressed and um, people stayed home. There weren't very many people out uh, getting traffic fines. Um, and then in the current year, the courts did not reopen for in-person hearings until June. And when they did, there were a lot of forgiveness programs to reduce um, fines or alternative payment arrangements. But we're expecting that revenue to increase next year at 14.8%. So in summary, our general fund revenues before transfers in are expected to be $220 million compared to 219.31 million in our amended budget. So that's an increase of 760,753 or 0.35% over the 2021 amended budget. It's 19.1 million or 9.5% over our 2020 actual results. And it's 10.4 million or 4.95% over our 2019 pre-COVID results. During 2019 and 2020, we saw the internet sales tax collection of remote um, or from businesses that are not located in the state. And that is one of the drivers behind the 4.95 increase over 2019. Now, including transfers in, we're actually expecting a slight decrease of 0.89%. You'll recall in last year's budget, we carried over the health insurance premium cost savings. That was a, a prior year carryover that we utilized to keep uh, costs consistent for employees. Um, we also utilized 850,000 of the 2019 contingency allocation um, to kind of stabilize the budget while we were waiting for revenues to recover. Both of those are going away. In addition, because of the 38 cent sales tax, we had accelerated projects with short-term financing notes previously. And the principal portion of those payments were transferred in from the 38 cent fund to make those note payments as um, the notes were being retired. All of the 38 cent related notes will be fully retired by the end of the year. So there's no additional transfers in 
um, from that revenue for uh, the note payments. So in total, again, it's a, an, a 0 0.89 decrease from the 2021 amended budget and a 1.9% increase from the 2019 actual results. And this just uh, gives you those, all the different types of revenue that I've discussed with the percent change that is um, by, by individual category. On the next slide, this is the summary level, the way that it's presented in our monthly financial reports. So again, in total, you're seeing a 0.89% a decrease or 1.9 million from the 2021 uh, amended budget, including transfers in. And this is a graph that shows that 82% um, of the general fund revenues are generated by a combination of sales tax, property tax, and our franchise fees. The total revenue budget, 226,166,164. So now I'm going to go through some of the personnel cost assumptions and other expenditures that are applicable to all funds. So this is not general, just general fund, this is all funds of the city, some of the things that will be applicable to all of the funds. First, we're going to have a continuation of the step and grade progression for the International Association of Firefighters, the Fraternal Order of Police, our AFSCME and union eligible positions, and the 911 communications positions. Currently in the budget, we have a 1.5% across the board salary increase at a cost of $2.22 million across all the funds. And this will also be um, added to the step and grade progressions for IAFF, FOP, AFSCME, and 911 communications. So they get both. Now, I will tell you that this is one of the items that may still be tweaked. We're looking at this. We're still negotiating with the unions. We're reviewing revenues as they come in to see if there's a potential to increase this any further. Um, as you're aware, employees um, have not had salary increases. I think 2018 was the last year for, for police and fire beyond step and grade. Our non-uniform employees, I think it was 2017 for the non-union, non-uniform. So other things that are included in our salary adjustments. We enhance the salaries for all positions requiring a commercial driver's license. This is extremely competitive. We've had a very difficult time competing for commercial driver's licenses, um, or employees with commercial driver's license. So the, the salary was raised to a minimum of $18 per hour at a cost of $1.2 million across the city. Um, the major impact was in the street fund, the waste disposal fund, and the, the fleet fund, and then there were some in parks as well. There is an additional 1% increase included in the budget for police command. This is lieutenants and majors to address some of the compression issues that they're um, experiencing. As the mayor mentioned at a press conference recently, um, as part of trying to recruit more um, officers, we're increasing the recruit incentives to $10,000 at a cost of $300,000. This um, would not be for the class that graduates in February. They were already hired on and had been working at the with the knowledge of a $5,000 um, incentives, so this would be for the next classes, which is why the $300,000 amount. Health insurance, um, renewal of our fully insured coverage with United Healthcare. There's a net decrease of approximately 700,000 reflected in personnel cost throughout all the um, funds. There are still buy-up options for lower deductibles and co-pays that are available to employees. And there's continuation of dental, vision, and basic life at no cost to employees for single coverage. Our pension rates. We have multiple pension plans. So our fire lot fee pension has been at the maximum contribution rate allowed by the state, 23.5, for a couple of years now, and that is unchanged. Police has now reached that maximum level at 23.5. Um, the state is limited to increasing it by 1% each year. Um, so the cap is 23.5. We only in, we increased from 23.23 to that maximum. 
The LOPTI contributions for police and fire are partially offset by the state pension turnback funds that are received, and those are included in the budget as intergovernmental revenues. The non-uniform pension contribution is 9%, and that's unchanged. Our non-uniform pension is very well funded. That's one that we implemented after the passage of the 2011 sales tax that began in 2012, and it's um, in the high 90% funding level. The APERS pension rates are unchanged at 15.32% for the judges and the court clerks. The district judges that are covered by the old ADJRS plan, the contribution rate is 42.51%. We only have one judge in that category. And the majority of the judges' salaries are paid by the state now. The judges and clerks' liability for the unfunded ADJRS plan is 185000 and that's unchanged. And then we have the closed non-uniform plan um, for employees hired in the uh, prior to the 1980-something. Anyway, that contribution rate is 560000 That's actuarially determined, and that is unchanged. That is another very well-funded plan. For our closed police and fire pension plans, um, we have dedicated revenues that make those contributions, which include the one mill property tax levy for each of those plans. We have an additional 500000 in city sales tax contributions that we um, included in our penny sales tax, and that continues to be funded to each of those plans. And then there's dedicated fines and fees um, for, the fi for the police pension plan. The uh, law fee calculates a required contribution which is 333,185 per month for the police plan and 268,268 per month for the fire plan. And you can see that that um, totals approximately 4 million for police and 3.2 million for fire. Those plans are very poorly funded. They're less than 50% funded. And the city contributes 100% of the dedicated revenues to try to pay down that unfunded liability to get it into a position where we can um, provide some, some potential increases. So the contribution anticipated for the closed police plan is 7,465,000, and for the closed fire plan is 6,649,000. Other personnel assumptions for all funds. <clears throat> We're going to add the Juneteenth holiday which will increase the um, holiday premium pay for police and fire by 335426 Our OPEB contribution, which is the retiree insurance actuarially determined, will increase 935000 from our original 2021 budget. We really had, we had the budget too low. We made an adjustment in the budget amendment increasing that, um, but we still didn't get it as high as it needs to be for 2022. The workers' compensation across all of the funds will increase 881,000 from the original 2021 budget and 256,000 from the 2021 amended budget. This has been impacted um, by COVID, but it's also been impacted by some of the legislative changes, particularly as it relates to firefighters and linking cancer to on-the-job um, illnesses. <clears throat> So now we're going to go through the full-time staffing um, changes. So this will take a minute. I know the print's a little small. Um, so executive administration will increase by two positions in the general fund from 28 to 30. This is not actually an increase in positions, though. Um, it is a consolidation of the racial and cultural diversity positions with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, those positions are being transferred from community programs into that Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, in addition, well, we'll move on down. So the community programs, you see the two, the reduction that corresponds to that. The city attorney's office will be gaining two positions. They've requested an additional assistant city attorney and a paralegal. Um, in addition, they'll be upgrading one of the positions <clears throat> to, from a, an assistant to a, an administrative office manager role. 
District Courts, First Division has added a court systems operations position to deal with the ACIC um, interaction and interface. And then the uh, District Court, Second Division has added a deputy court clerk. District Court, Third Division has added a full-time environmental court assistant. They had that role as a part-time position. They upgraded it to a full-time position and they exchanged the part-time dollars as partial offset for that. In finance, there are three added positions, a procurement data analyst, a procurement buyer, and we reinstated the financial system analyst position um, and added an accounting clerk too, primarily to address FOIA requests. Uh, all, so many of the FOIA requests end up in finance and we're pulling literally thousands and thousands and thousands of, of invoices and we just cannot continue to do that and keep up with our daily work. Um, but we've also eliminated the Deputy Director of Finance Operations position. In Human Resources, we're adding a Labor Relations Analyst for FMLA and um, the American Disability Act. Information Technology is adding a Network Security Analyst position. Planning and development has an increase of seven positions, but similar to executive administration, four of these are actually transferred from Public Works Street Fund, um, including a design review engineer, an environmental compliance engineer, and two engineering specialists. Um, this was because the work was primarily done in planning and they needed to, to uh, move these positions over to planning. Uh, in addition, during 2021, they added an environmental planning manager and, and added an electrical inspector and a plumbing and gas inspector to address backlog and um, demand for services. Housing and neighborhood programs, public works, parks and recreation, golf and gym daily fitness are all remaining unchanged. The zoo has added an assistant or is adding an assistant curator position. No change for fire. Um, in police, there's a decrease of 60, a net decrease of 60 positions. This is because emergency, 911 emergency communications is going to be broken out into a separate department. There are 65 positions transferring from police into the new emergency manager or emergency communications department. It's the same 65 positions that was in police. Um, in addition to that, they are adding three new telephone reporting clerks. This has been a very successful program and relieves stress on officers um, who, who don't have to respond to those calls. We're also adding a county jail reimbursement position and a crime analyst position. So the county jail reimbursement position, um, as you are aware, the county has planned for years to go to a daily rate billing. Um, I'll, I'll be talking about this a little more when we get to our outside agency funding, but we need to have a position that can validate those bills, ensure that the um, prisoner days we're being charged for are truly Little Rock prisoners, and that when the time shifts over to being a county prisoner, that that occurs, and if they are not part of Little Rock's jurisdiction, that we're not billed for them. Then. Um, as I mentioned in, in emergency communications, that's the 65 positions that is being relocated from the police department. So in total, there will be 1,727 full-time positions proposed, which is an increase of 23 from the 2021 adopted budget. Next, we move to our special positions. No change in executive administration. Community programs is adding three. Um, a community programs data analyst and two positive intervention spe uh, specialist positions. Finance will have three grant funded positions. One is associated with the 21st Century Grant Coordinator at West Central. This grant's administered in finance. Then there's a grant, the Grant Compliance Coordinator is funded with the ARPA admin dollars. We've talked about that. The board approved that last year during the um, first round, first tranche of spending. And then we're also adding the accounting clerk that I mentioned previously, if approved by the board for the ARPA admin. No other changes in our special project positions. In, let me see, oh, got there. 
In waste disposal, there's no change in the number of positions. Public Works Street Fund is a net decrease of three positions, which include the four that were transferred to planning that we've already discussed, and then they're adding a new environmental compliance engineer. Fleet Services has a net decrease of one position. They've eliminated a fleet parts clerk and a fleet parts clerk senior, and they're adding a senior service advisor. So in total for our other funds, there's a decrease of four. There'll be 433 authorized positions for a grand total of 2,216 authorized full-time positions, which is a net increase of 25. So in summary, our staffing, you see that um, 1,192 of the 2,216 full-time positions are police, fire, and 911, which is 53.8% of the workforce. Street and waste disposal make up 16.3% of the workforce. Parks and zoo add 8.7%. Housing adds 4.5%. Fleet and vehicle storage add 3.4%, and all other um, departments combined are 13.3%, or 294 positions. Now we'll move on to the fleet allocations for fuel and vehicle maintenance. The fleet department determines the um, costs and uh, bills those to the various departments. Our parts expenses, are expected to increase by approximately $393,350. This is partly due to the um, fact that, well, there's some price increases, but also because uh, we do not expect to be able to replace the fleet as frequently, so some of the older vehicles will have to be kept uh, running. The fleet rate per gallon, including the uh, 18 cent markup, that covers the labor and supplies in the Fleet Fuel Acquisitions Division is budgeted at $2.73 for unleaded gasoline and $2.93 for diesel, compared to the 2021 rates of $2.09 and $2.19, respectively. So the cost will increase by $586,560. In total, with the changes in labor, parts, um, sublet costs, fuel, we're expecting the fleet department to bill other, other funds 1.4 million more than what was billed in 2021. Next, we're going to talk about some of our funding highlights for our outside agencies. So the Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts um, budget includes a proposed increase of 400,000, um, anticipating the uh, fourth quarter opening. Rock Region Metro funding will remain unchanged at $9,854,118. Included in the budget right now, we have no change in our Pulaski County Jail funding, which is $2,554,153, of which 160,000 160, comes from a local jail fine project. Now, I'll tell you, this number, we really have no idea what it's going to be in 2022. Um, we received a draft simulated bill for April that if you were to annualize that, it would have been over $8.7 million. But when looking at that billing, there were, first of all, it was supposed to be for a month, and there were well over 60 days for many prisoners, and there's not more than 30 days in 31 days in any month. And beyond 60 days, prisoners transitioned to the county. Um, so we, we forwarded the draft that we received to the police department and to Judge Martin. And Major Miller and Judge Martin got together, worked through the billing, determined that beyond the obvious errors, there were many, many errors. And what was initially a, a $700,000 amount for the month they felt that 65,000 was the more accurate number. So um, the similar things happened with the other cities within the county jurisdiction. The sheriff's office has been working on their data. They produced a couple of other um, examples that still have some data issues. Um, the latest estimate that we received actually just 
yesterday, I believe, or Monday, you know, yesterday, <laughs> showed potentially a 16% increase based on their revised average. But what we have done is include the new position in the budget who can analyze and really review the bills to determine what we will reimburse. And then if necessary, um, we are looking at potentially doing an amendment later in the year but um, or, or taking other action if we so choose to do so. But we do not think that the increase will be anywhere near what we initially thought. Um, the Oakland Fraternal Cemetery maintenance of 50,000 that was included in the 2021 budget amendment is anticipated to continue in 2022. The downtown partnership allocation will increase by 50,000 just to encompass the other annual contracts that we were paying for ambassadors in the clean and green program, roll it into one outside agency allocation. Our debt service and bond agent fees on short-term financing notes will decrease. Um, there'll be 3,530,000 in 2022, which is a decrease of 728,393. We retired two 2016 short-term notes. The lot, one of those was the last note issued to advance 38 cent projects. Um, that debt rolls off at 1,919, and then the note that we issued last year adds a million two, so the net impact is a decrease of 728,000. Now I'm gonna talk about expenditures specific to the general fund. So this is the by category um, description of expenditures. You'll notice on line one, personnel, and I'm gonna compare it to the original budget because the vacancy savings allocations impact the amended budget. Um, and then uh, also we had the budget amendment that included the, the large amount for fire overtime. But we're anticipating our personnel cost to increase from the 2021 original budget by 7,132,183. We're expecting supplies to decrease 34,000, fleet to increase 878,000, and I've been through the reasons for that. Repairs and maintenance will increase 481,000. Utilities will increase. For the utility budget, um, we internally analyzed all of our utility bills, adjusted based on experience, and then we added 4% associated with energy and gas billings. Um, contracts, 731,000 increase. Outside agency funding, $508,000 increase. Capital outlays, 72,500. The decrease in debt service that I just described. We've increased the vacancy allocation by 75,000. And our transfers um, will increase 2,518,000. This includes our special project funding, our contingency allocation, and our grant match. I'm gonna go through these, individual, these lines um, in detail in just a moment. In total, this is a $12 million increase from our 2021 original budget and just a $288,000 increase from our 2021 amended budget. But you'll recall, on, like on contracts, you see the decrease from the amended budget of 4.4 million. That's because of the 5 million that we just approved for the port, um, which is not included in next year's budget. So the first, the um, personnel increase of 7 million 132, 183. I've already mentioned also the vacancy savings increase of 70,000, and we've been through the 23 positions that are being added in the general fund. So to summarize by category, the 23 positions, including the related benefits, will add 2,281,167 to personnel cost. The current 1.5% across the board, including step and grade, will increase 1,850,450. We have increased the fire overtime allocation by a million two hundred and fifty dollars. You'll recall we had a larger adjustment in our budget amendment, but we also had a lot of absences associated with COVID that increased overtime as well. 
We're not expecting that to continue. And there's some other measures that I'll talk about in a minute that should reduce fire over time. Um, we've already talked about the other post-employment benefit increase of 935,000. The general fund's portion of the workers' compensation increase is 640,000. Um, we always accrue a vacation sick payout amount for retiring employees. Last year in the original budget, that was 1250000 We increased it in the budget amendment, and I have increased it in the 2022 budget to 1750000 $1, The addition of the Juneteenth holiday adds 335426 to the holiday premium pay for police and fire. We've increased the police recruit incentives. That adds 300000 these next two items are some of the additional measures that we're taking to make fire more efficient and to reduce overtime cost. Um, fire plans to add some teams of non-uniform EMTs to um, go on EMT calls. There will still be a, a firefighter with them, but it would not be the full fire crew. This would be using some of the fire response vehicles that we purchased um, previously. And then in addition, they're planning to use um, and I believe, I, I believe that was three fire EMTs they were going to hire. Then there's, um, well, actually it's part-time, so it could be multiple. Um, and the same thing with training. They're planning to use retired firefighters to help assist with the training to reduce the, the overtime demand on training. Uh, the change in the closed fire pension plan is a decrease of 115862 and that's due to uh, reduced property tax revenues associated with the, um, the excess commissions that were in 2021 and a reduction in the turn back. And then also um, all other salary and benefit changes is a net decrease. So this includes the decrease for health insurance, um, 138,497. The change in the closed police plan is a decrease of 342,000 for the same reasons I mentioned in fire. And then the decrease associated with, oh, so the 138 did not include health insurance. The decreases for uh, health, dental, and vision is 601,390 is the impact to the general fund. Now, in addition to these things I've mentioned, FIRE does plan to have two recruit classes during 2022, two recruit schools that will also help to, I think, reduce some of the overtime by filling those positions more quickly. So that was the 7,132,183 change in personnel. Next, um, we're gonna go over some of the repair and maintenance expenditure additions. There's a net increase of $481,810. Environmental Courts is adding 2,500 for Adobe Pro and Office 365 licenses. Finance is adding 13,030 for galvanized internal audit software license, Office 365, and our uh, TRS annual software maintenance for our annual report software. Information technology has a net increase of 187,000. This includes 200,000 for the operating portion of Exchange 2019 upgrade and additional applications and 50,000 to upgrade internet speed to five gigabytes across the city, um, city, city owned facilities. Net of transfers of 40,000 to training and 23,000 to supplies. The river market anticipates $29,280 increase in building maintenance. Zoo, we're restoring the 250,000 amount. We did this in our budget amendment as well. It was not in the original 2021 adopted budget because we anticipated um, revenues would be slow to recover. And as we've mentioned, they did fully recover. Utilities will increase 579,042. And as I described, we analyzed and adjusted based on experience. Um, we had some units where the budget was too high, we had others where it was too low, and then we adjusted the electricity and gas by 4% from previous experience based on um, anticipated increases. Contracts will, um, are projected to increase 731,570. Um, administrative, general administrative is expected to increase 282,548. 
That's a combination of the property and EDP insurance renewal increase. And then other contracts like the waste removal, the legal defense fund, um, and various memberships. The executive administration, diversity, equity, and inclusion office will have $52,020 in contracts. That's a combination of cons consolidating the budget that came from racial and cultural diversity. And you'll recall we had previously we had $150,000 allocation annually in a special project for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that included the Hispanic Outreach, the Municipal ID Program. All of that is being consolidated into one diversity, equity, and inclusion office. So um, th this, the 150,000 will go away, those employees and the Racial and Cultural Diversity Office will be consolidated into the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office and these expenses, these are the operating expenses that will be going with it. Community programs budget will decrease $10,635 in contracts, and this was the, the piece that was allocated to racial and cultural diversity previously. Traffic court will increase $12,447. Graded their security guard contract from unarmed to armed guards, and that increased the cost. And then they also have some uh, professional organization dues. Finances contracts went up 14,500. This is to increase or an increase to restore the professional training and development budget that was reduced um, during COVID and in the previous budget and the professional memberships, and it's to um, provide scheduling and survey subscriptions for the Small Business Development Office and procurement. Human Resources has an increase of $19,238 for a national advertising module for positions, um, a Spark Hire module um, that is integrated with our NeoGov um, onboarding system, and then a city career fair. Information technology, as I mentioned earlier, transferred 40,000 from their maintenance budget to contracts, and this was to provide for uh, technical training and development. And then Parks and Recreation has a one-time allocation of 75,000 for the Tri Creeks Greenway um, Trail Phase Two design. River market contracts will increase 162,371. This really just restores what we cut last year when they were closed. So this is to restore those facility contracts and the public relations um, budgets that were suspended in 2021 due to the impact of COVID. Golf, we've had to amend each year because the golf cart leases were not in the budget. So we're putting them in on the onset this time at 55,000. Fire, we're adding 40,000 to provide for co contracted annual firefighter physicals. These are enhanced physicals for the firefighters. The police contracts will decrease 71,437. There was an insurance allocation of 11,369 in their budget that was actually covered in our overall property insurance budget, so we took that out. And then the remaining 60,068 was just the reclassification of the portion that related to the 911 emergency communications. And you'll see it coming in there. All other changes were $450. Um, as we mentioned previously, the fleet allocation for labor, fuel, and vehicle service in general fund departments will increase by a net of 878,642. I've described the reasons for those changes previously. And so now we will talk about outside agency debt service and transfers out. So outside agencies, um, we've already talked about this um, at a high level. Uh, as I mentioned, Rock Region Metro, there's no increase. The total budget is $9,854,000, of which $7,854,000 is in the general fund. The $2,000,000 is remaining in the street fund. There's no change. Um, they will continue to receive some support from the uh, transit allocation for the American Rescue Plan, which will absorb any increases. Regional Detention Center, currently we do not have 
an increase in the budget, but we'll be monitoring this, and if needed, it will be included in a budget amendment later next year um, if, if, we ver if we verify that that is actual. The Arkansas Museum of Fine Arts, I've already described the $400,000 increase. Museum of Discovery support, you'll recall we made an amendment during the year to allocate an additional $175,000 due to the mold remediation and flood damage caused by the snowstorm. So that will go away and their allocation will um, revert back to the $192,000. Metro plan is a slight increase. This is totally due to the population change. It's 92 cents per capita. The downtown partnership, as I mentioned, um, it's going to be $195,000. We're encompassing um, the ambassador and the clean and green programs that we had been paying for um, into one contribution. Uh, the Oakland Fraternal Cemetery, this is one we added during the budget amendment. Um, and so the change from the original budget is 50,000, but it's not an increase from what we've paid in 2021. So in total, um, an increase of $506,342 from the original 2021 budget to bring it to $12,290,486 for outside agency funding. The debt service, I've already described, that will decrease $728,000 to $3,530,252. Transfers out. So, we transfer funds for special projects um, and grant match, and the special project total will be 9113000 and I'll go through that in detail in a minute. That is an increase of 2286000 over the original 2021 budget and 1412000 over the amended budget. Um, street, the contribution to street for parking enforcement will remain the same at 194000 Grant match will increase 132,500 to 362,500, and we're increasing our contingency, contingency reserve by 100,000. We want that contingency allocation to be um, approximately 0.5% of revenues before transfers in. And the purpose of this is to address fluctuations in revenue projections or expenditures to have a reserve available, and then if not needed, it can be um, utilized to increase our, our fund balance. So on the next slide, we're going to start going through our uh, special projects. On line um, one, of course, the COVID costs are gone. Um, on line two, the children, youth, and families um, allocation, we reduced that in the 2021 um, due to the continued impact of COVID and some of the programs that would not occur, we're restoring that to its $5 million um, original balance. The uh, facility improvements will stay at $875,000. The fleet replacement allocation, um, we had $850,000 that we were allocating from our operating budget annually, and then the remainder of the fleet budget was in the 38 cent fund. Um, we are increasing this to a million three, as I mentioned, to cover the leases on the vehicles that have already been delivered. And that's an increase of 450,000. The budget amendment included the 750,000 for the first floor of 12th Street. That goes away. The homeless outreach, we are increasing this budget 200,000. North Little Rock, we had, for years, we have contributed two-thirds of the budget. North Little Rock had contributed one-third to support the operation of Jericho Way and Homeless Outreach Services. We were notified by North Little Rock that they have their own um, program that they're doing for unsheltered individuals in North Little Rock, and they no longer plan to support Jericho Way. So we are increasing that budget 200000 to make up for um, what we're losing. Um, on the weed lot maintenance, that stays the same. Um, branding, we have sufficient funds carried over, so we're reducing that 200000 Employee wellness, last year this was funded out of the health insurance rebate that we received, um, so we do not have dollars in the budget currently for this, so we're allocating a special project to provide for our wellness coordinator and wellness activities. 
Then, um, as I mentioned earlier, the di diversity, equity, and inclusion allocation will go away. Those expenditures, those personnel that were paid from this, um, along with the, the other expenses, have been transferred to the diversity, equity, and inclusion office. So it's one complete budget. On the next slide, um, you'll recall that last year, line 18, we added a um, homeless emergency services allocation in the amendment. It was 100,000. This was for like hotel vouchers for extreme weather events, things like that. We also provided uh, funds for Hurricane Ida victims that sheltered in Little Rock. We're reducing that to 50,000 in the 2022 budget, hoping that there's not another hurricane event, but still providing for weather um, vouchers. The Little Rock Residency Incentive Program, we did not fund that in 2021 because we had sufficient uh, carryover funds. We have exhausted those funds, and so we're allocating 50000 next year. Um, the commercial development or commercial demolition will continue. The land bank we have not funded um, in the last year. This covers some of the administrative cost and there is a, a land bank um, position that is also paid out of that. Most of the funds for land bank come from um, the, the turnover of properties. Legislative consulting will remain at 45,000. This is for our local state legislative consulting. We've continuing the tennis open allocation um, the board and secure. There's sufficient funds remaining for sister cities since there were no travel events in the last few years. Um, current hall budget remains the same. Uh, the next one that has a change is on line 33. Um, in the budget amendment, we have the agreement with the airport and Little Rock Water Reclamation um, and other partners for a federal consultant in the the board approved the contract during the current year and we included it in the amendment. There were only six months in the current year. So the 48,000 for next year anticipates a full year's worth of coverage that we would have some kind of a renewal of that contract. And then everything else remains the same. So again, 9,113,000 for special projects. Grant match. So the first two items, the choice neighborhoods and the assistance to firefighters, we have sufficient carryover funds available for those. The 21st century learning, this is grant match for that grant that will continue. This is the West Central grant. And then there's an emergency management grant managed by parks um, for the hazard mitigation and Canis Park Bridge. And uh, that match is 62,500 that the city has been awarded. And then, um, the parks and the zoo take turns on the outdoor recreation grant, and this year it is parks turn for $250,000. So those are the identified um, grant match amounts. There are some carryovers available that will be continued towards the programs that we've previously been awarded. So expenditures by category in total, personnel makes up 75% of the general fund budget, when you add transfers and outside agency, which are those special projects and the outside agency contributions, that gets us to 85% of the general budget and leaves 15% for all other expenditures. Of the 75% in personnel cost in the general fund, police, fire, and 911 make up 75% of that personnel cost. The total expenditure is $222,166,164, a balanced general fund budget. The next two slides just give you this information by department. I will have a separate handout that Ashley will pass out. She may have already passed it out for you to take home and review at your leisure that gives you descriptions for each of the departments. But the, the executive administration, the number line one with the general and employee benefits, this is where that OPEB contribution and the um, workers' comp and the increased vacation sick payout accrual, all of those things fall in that category. The executive administration, mayor, city manager, and all the other divisions, like the city clerk, LRTV, 
um, all of the other divisions of executive administration. The total increase is 357,000, and the majority of that is the transfer of those um, costs for the racial or the diversity, equity, and inclusion office from community programs and the special project. But all of these things, I'm not going to go through all of them because they are described in your packet. I'm just going to point out some of them that look odd. The decrease in community programs, that's the transfer of the um, racial and cultural diversity office. As you turn to the next slide, you'll see there's a, a decrease in fire from the amended. That's because of the addition that we made for overtime during the amendment. The fire budget actually is increasing a million eight seventy eight eight forty two from the original budget. Police shows a decrease of three point two million dollars. That's due to the transfer of the 911 communications division, which is right below it. So we actually moved four million seven hundred and forty one dollars out of police for 911 communications. So there's a net increase in police as well when compared um, excluding 911. But again, you've got the separate handout to go through, and we'll be happy to address any questions that you have once you've had a chance to look at that. Just this is a long enough presentation. <laughs> so in total, our expenditures by department, police makes up 35% of the general fund budget, fire makes up 25% of the general fund budget. Um, police, fire, 911 uh, communications, the employee benefits division, and um, that general admin other, the outside agency contributions, debt service transfers. That makes up 75.4% of the total budget. So in summary, our revenues before transfers that we went through um, are increasing 14.8 million from the amended budget our transfers in are actually decreasing 2.7 million from the original budget for a net increase of $12 million to 222,166,164. Our expenditures are also budgeted at 222,166,164 for a balanced general fund budget. Now we'll go through the other funds quickly. So our street fund forecast um, the property tax revenues are um, going to be just slightly above uh, the same period a year ago. We did not um, forecast property taxes as high last year. They have the same reduction associated with the excess commissions, and this, too, represents a 2.5% increase, which is what the county gave us um, to project net of the reduction associated with the commissions. And then the state tax turn back is, um, it, it's a $2.3 million increase from the original budget, but we amended the budget mid-year to reflect the actual experience with the sales tax um, and the state turn back. And so this is consistent with that budget. Um, the reduction in transfers in, um, I mentioned the change in CDL licenses uh, or the, the salaries for CDL drivers. Um, this really impacted the waste disposal fund, as you can imagine. And so they had traditionally transferred an amount into the street fund for overhead allocation for the executive team of the street fund. We're not going to do this year, do that this year to give them some relief um, with the salary increases for CDL drivers. It also reflects the reduction of the health insurance holiday. The expenditures in the street fund their share of the personnel expenses are increasing $701,980. Um, a, a large portion of this, too, is associated with the increase in CDL salaries. That impacted um, the street fund, I think, by between $350,000 and $400,000 in total. Um, fleet costs increase, as discussed on previous slides. The utilities were adjusted for street um, the same as they were for the general fund. Um, and I will show you the transfers out in detail on the next slide. So the street fund will allocate a million two for vehicle and equipment replacement as they have previously. Um, they provide an administrative overhead uh, allocation for contract review and um, payroll in the, and things in the general fund. 
They are adding a $400,000 mowing right-of-way contract. They are continuing the re-entry sidewalk program and the re-entry right-of-way program. They are funding the bridge to work program at $100,000. Um, they are purchasing some survey equipment for $75,000. And then um, they have $50,000 for a national pollutant discharge elimination system, NPDES permit program for a total allocation of $2,729,717. Next is waste disposal. Sanitation fees are projected to increase um, $279,000 from the amended budget, $60,000 from the original budget. We had to decrease the amended budget because there were still some slow um, payments, delinquent uh, payments associated with the, the bills um, due to COVID. We expect that to be restored next year. Landfill fees are picking up. Um, You'll recall that the landfill was closed at the last part of 2020 and the first part of 2021 to new haulers while the new cell was being constructed. It took a while for those haulers to return, but they have. And um, so that is the increase there. Um, interest is dropping across all funds and that's due to the reduction in interest rates. Miscellaneous revenue is decreasing. The bulk of the miscellaneous revenue comes from the auction of fleet vehicle or of vehicles, um, old garbage trucks and refuse vehicles and that kind of thing. They have been turning those over regularly. They do not have a lot of old trucks to auction. We anticipate that number to go down next year. And um, the reduction in transfers in is associated with the, the uh, elimination of that health insurance premium holiday carryover. So their personnel cost is going up $673,361. Um, there are no new positions. This is driven um, in a large part by the minimum increase for CDL drivers. Also the step and grade progression and the 1.5% across the board salary increase net of the reduction to health insurance premiums. We did increase the vacancy savings allocation by 100,000. But if you'll notice in the 2021 amended column, the fact that that's a positive number means that they had exceeded the $400,000 budget last year um, when we did the amendment, which reflected expenses through uh, July. So um, Mr. Honeywell felt comfortable adjusting that vacancy savings allocation. The fleet and fuel budget um, is an increase of 275,000 from the amended budget, a decrease of 230,000 from the original budget. If you'll look at um, 2020 actual, we just have had this budget too high for maintenance, and I think it's the it's the um, the vehicle maintenance piece of it, the parts and repairs because of renewing the fleet that has gone down. So we decreased that repairs budget. Uh, all of the other numbers are fairly consistent um, with the exception of transfers. And so um, I'll show you the detail for the waste disposal transfers. They will continue to provide funding for the environmental youth um, programs, the anti-litter programs, um, and the, their general fund uh, overhead allocation, um, which is a calculation based on invoices and personnel and, and total costs um, to the overhead units, uh, but they will not be providing the $183,700 overhead allocation to the street fund next year in order to come in with a balanced budget at $23,777,100. So next is the fleet revenue budget. Um, we've already talked quite a bit about fleet services. The fleet labor cost billing includes not only the cost of labor, but also the expenses um, for that labor, their, their operating expenses and tools and things like that. Um, but the big increase is being driven by the change in the uh, rate for CDL drivers. Um, in addition to the step and grade, the 1.5% across the board net of the health insurance. Uh, fuel, we've already talked about that increase and the rate per gallon. We've already talked about really all of the components of this. 
Um, we do expect, as I mentioned, repairs, parts, and sublet billings to increase um, with the loss of the ability to, to turn fleet over as um, quickly. Oh, back to, sorry. The expense forecast um, personnel, and we talk, again, they're billing, their revenues look a lot like the expenses because they're billing other departments for these expenses. So we've really covered all of this um, in detail already. So I'm gonna move on to vehicle storage. So vehicle storage, um, we're expecting revenues of 1896 This is an increase of 136000 from the original budget, a decrease of 163 from the amended budget. The reason for the decrease, you'll see on line five, the auction sales and handling fees. When everything shut down with COVID, so did the auctions. Um, when we resumed at the end of 2020 and the first part of 2021, we had... Um, a whole lot of auctions you can well you can see 2021's auctions were over a million dollars in our amendment so we're expecting that to go back to normal on their expenses um same story on personnel cost uh we do expect a decrease in um repairs and maintenance um, we had added last year in the amended budget, we added 100000 for some land maintenance and fencing, and that's going away. But we're increasing the contract budget by 98000 because we expect towing contracts to increase with the increased traffic and, and resumption of normal um, business. Now, the parking garage fund. Um, here, we've, we've struggled this year. Um, licenses and permits decreased 24 percent when uh, the impact of COVID we had a lot of uh, taxi cab they reduced the number of licenses and we had companies that um, went out of business as well our street repair revenues had been very high in 2020 um, part of that was due to the rollout of fiber throughout the city Verizon and AT&T were digging everywhere um, and then also the board had changed the ordinance and instituted penalties associated with not timely repairing streets. Well, utilities now are getting with the program. People are, are doing that more timely. So we're seeing those um, penalties decrease. We're also seeing activity decrease. We budgeted 400,000, which we expect to be the um, new average for street cuts. Parking meters. Um, declined um, significantly in 2020. They've increased some in 2021. We expect them to be um, at two, they, they increased slower than we expected, though. We originally forecast 298,000. We amended that to 253,000. We've got that budget back up to 299,000 for 2022. Monthly parking held its course pretty well during COVID, but daily parking suffered significantly. So we're expecting a return of daily parking with um, an increase in downtown events. And same with our surface and other parking. So overall, we're hoping our parking revenues will return to the $2.5 million level. Um, this year, they're, they're closer to $2.1 million, million, and we're not sure that daily parking is going to meet that $313,000. So for the expenses, um, beginning in 2021, we started blowing those out. They used to just all be combined in parking deck operations for the most part, and we've blown them out by category. Um, there was a, a reduction um, in 2020 uh, to help offset lost revenues. Um, 2021 just expects a return of the um, operations. We do expect for the revenues to be sufficient this year to cover all the debt service on the bonds that's coming due, and then, of course, it will return next year. Our coverage has declined, though. It had been up in the close to two times, and it's uh, now closer to 1.5. So, in summary, these are our revenues and expenditures by fund as proposed. The street fund will have net income of 571,152. Vehicle storage will have net income of 112,651. 
The parking garage will have net income of 743,878, which is necessary for the principal portion of the payment and coverage. Um, in total, 1,427,681 in net income is anticipated with the general fund, waste disposal fund, and fleet fund balanced. And the next slide just shows the breakdown by the funds. So grand total, um, 288,913,693 revenue forecast by fund with the general fund making up 77% of that. So thank you for bearing with me through this lengthy presentation. We are obviously not asking you to do any kind, we're not, we do not have this on the agenda or anything um, for next week for a vote. We know we'll have additional discussions. And as I mentioned, we are still looking, uh, negotiating our, our union contracts and looking at revenues as they um, become available. But we do hope to have the budget um, adopted before the last possible day this year. <laughs> so um, we'll be happy to take your questions. You can save those for the next meeting if you prefer. I'll be here to respond to any questions. And then, as I mentioned, you've got the handout on the general fund expenditures as well. Mayor. Director Wright. I guess this question would be for you and Mr. Moore. Uh, if a ward director has a project in her ward that she would like or he would like to get uh, included in the budget, what is the process for that? Mr. Moore. It, it really depends on if it's capital in nature or operational in nature. I mean, that, that's the first uh, thing you have to consider. Uh, and then, um, you, you know, it's proposed and, um, you know, Sarah at the beginning uh, made some uh, comments around some additional one-time money that um, could be available. Um, and all of it's not accounted for. These are just some options that uh, departments really have um, come up with at this point. So if I want to inc ask for an allocation for improvements to the West Central uh, ball fields, how would I go about doing that? Um, again, I would uh, just, and I know you've done a lot of work uh, in that area, and uh, just be a matter of. There's been no work on those fields. No, I said. I said you've done a lot of work on uh, trying to get something done, and I don't know if there's particular uh, a uh, cost estimate. That's what I was referring to at this point. How would I go about getting that included? An allocation for the improvement to the West Central Ball Fields included in the budget. Director Ed, again, I would, uh, you know, su submit that, uh, and I don't know, my, my question was, I don't know if there's a cost estimate that you already have. Um, so I will submit that to you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's one. Then the 36th Street Bridge that I had requested two years ago for an allocation out of uh, any funding that we received from the Highway Department. Uh, tax. And I, I believe um, there was a memo that uh, that we sent um, with that cost assessment, and it was it was pretty significant. It was outrageously significant, and it included a great deal that wasn't even required. Nobody wants four lanes. We just mm -hmm. want the bridge replaced and sidewalks put on the other side of the bridge, and so. I would like to see that revised to reflect what I asked for and not trying to make all the 36th Street four lanes, which is impossible to do anyway. It's already been improved. The bridge was just not addressed. And again, I would just uh, recommend that uh, you have proposals. So um, I submit that another proposal to you for 36th Street bridge and for the West Central ball fields. And what about uh, Union Park? Because I'd asked for an interior walking trail in that park to go along I, with the other improvements that we've been trying to get done. I, I do believe that's already funded. Um, I think it, that's just in the design phase and that's already funded. Thank you for that. I do have uh, 
a significant number of questions, Mayor. I know this has already gone long, so I can either type those up and send them in to you and Mr. Moore for you to all to address, uh, because this we are we are already at what 5:30, and we hadn't even gotten to the agenda yet. Yes, whatever you prefer, Director Wright. Because I did have I did make quite a few notes on this that I wanted some answers to some questions and. Um, I think the main thing was how do we get, how do I get something included in the budget because you all have already balanced it, uh, but uh, I did want to ask a question uh, regarding uh, animal services. I had a constituent to call me about some stray dogs that they were having an issue with, and I was told, much to my surprise, that we only have one in one dog catcher. Is that and I would, I've had that confirmed. So my question is, where is that? Is that the only allocated position that we have in animal services? This is a large city. I can't no, see that we would just have one. No, ma'am. Um, uh, that's even pre-pandemic. Uh, that's just a tough job to fill. Uh, it's even tougher now. Um, and uh, Mr. Rourke has authorization to fill all of those, uh, his vacant positions, um, HR, because it's been such a tough um, position. They even had a special job fair just for animal services. How many uh, positions would be for dog catcher? So I can answer my constituents quick question, because I have no idea. Yeah, and I would, we refer to them as animal services officers, but uh, there's about uh, at least five that authorize, and that's not including the uh, supervisors. That makes more sense. Okay. Okay, I think I can wait on my other questions. Um, I can type those up uh, and send them in. Yes, ma'am. Director Adcock. Yes. I also have a list of questions. Would it be possible to meet with uh, Sarah? and go over these questions instead of having to type them all up, then her give an answer, then me have another question? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Hines. Yes, um, Bruce and Sarah, uh, could you please email these documents to me so I can port them around? I'm having to keep up with the 80-page deal and a 13-page general fund document. We will. Thank Ashley you. will get that out to everybody. Mayor, Director Miller. Just a quick question. I, I know that there is, I guess I've read this, of targeted funds for certain wards, targeted, targeted enhancement funds, and it states that those are looked at with surplus money. I, I may need some help in trying to formulate this question. What? Because there was, I mean, I know there are some meetings going on about projects that could be addressed with surplus funds. Am I thinking, am I making that up in my head or did I read that somewhere? That there are some enhanced funds, but they have to be surplus funds. I, I don't know what you're referring to. Um, we do have a, the city board uh, passed a resolution for targeted community development. Right. Um, okay. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yes. So uh, part of that resolution, I believe it was to, uh, as funds are available to address up to 25 million, I think 5 million a year um, to identify in wards one, two, six, and seven. Uh, but it, it, the language says as funds are available, it does not say uh, surplus. So when it says funds are available, if that's not surplus funds, what is that? Mr. Moore, maybe uh, could you explain just, um, it can be surplus funds to answer your question. Uh, yes, I believe this budget shows a balanced budget with a net income of about 1.4, 1. 1.4 million. Um, clearly, uh, as things are available, for instance, I give you a great example. Um, 
this is not what targeted community development was intended for at all. For instance, this city board, uh, I believe at our last, uh, I believe it was the July um, sales tax, we had about five million in surplus. We utilized that five million for the Trex company to obtain land. As you're aware, the Little Rock Port Authority is in Ward One. Technically, that is that could be considered as targeted community development. However, we know that's not what residents would consider targeted community development. But when we have funds available, those are opportunities to do projects. So that's number one. Number two, there are certain projects that this board has already approved as it relates to the first tranche of uh, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, some of those projects do qualify for targeted community development and have that will be funded. So there are projects already a part of that process, but uh, Director Warwick, you're a part of the target, uh, target community development. Um, any brief comments? Mayor. Just one second, Director Warwick, then we'll come to Director Wright. We're really just um, gathering information at this point. We've had three meetings. Uh, we were anticipating some money from the sales tax, which did not happen, but that hasn't deterred us. We're going to um, do surveys in the neighborhood, have meetings with the neighborhoods, um, and the first one to talk about it will be November the 13th, which is Ward 2. And then the next one will be December the 4th, which is Ward 7. And so we're just really gathering information at this point. But the idea was that as we had additional dollars, that we would apply that money to uh, projects in those four wards. Yes. Does that help with there? Does that help you? Okay. It does, but I guess. As I, as I authored the. Uh, document, I think I can speak to what the intent, intent was. And the intent was to identify money in our general fund to set aside, not just uh, surplus funds. We can set aside money in this budget toward targeted community development initiatives uh, for these particular wards. And um, that's one of the questions that I've, I have for the city manager as I was talking about the 36th Street Bridge, uh, the West Central Ballpark, uh, things like that that are of interest to the community out there because uh, there are designated areas in and around and that in, in Ward 6 of which 36th Street was a critical part of it. So the projects that I'm going to be submitting would be a part of the targeted community development initiative, but it it was to identify money out of the general fund in addition to any sales tax revenue that we were able to get. Because if we just wait on uh, as funds become available, there will never be, because there's always something else that's added, like the Museum of Discovery will need money. Well, why can't we ask for some of that money? For our neighborhoods, that that's that's the whole purpose was to bring some emphasis. Now, can to you areas. Can I continue on just a little bit more? I promise I won't take up too much time. Uh, sure. We, uh, as I said, we're in the process of developing what neighborhood desires are, what they want to see in their community. Uh, for Ward Seven, I said specific identified areas and. I have a particular area in mind that I want to start with, and the things that those individuals need are better housing, um, drainage projects, infrastructure. Um, they have some health issues from uh, the homes that they're living in, uh, potentially have mold. So those are big ticket items. Um, and with us having 1.4 million uh, left after we balanced the money, I could spend 1.4 million on two streets probably. So um, there's going to be, are you, are you okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but when you start looking at drainage and street projects, I mean, street projects are not cheap. Uh, and just the overall um, 
look and feel and health of the community. I mean, they're going to be they're going to be big ticket items. The other things that I call low hanging fruit are um, picking up bulky items. Um, you know, those kinds of things that uh, our neighborhoods expect us to do. And when I looked through the budget, I didn't see um, that much of an increase in picking up things like that and taking care of the neighborhoods. It seems like we're status quo. But to me, that that's low-hanging fruit. And we could go through and clean up our neighborhoods and make them look a little bit better um, if we increase the work um, in cleaning up our neighborhoods and uh, ditches and uh, mowing uh, vacant lots, you know, those kinds of things. So that could easily be added into the budget to take care of that. But the items that I'm interested in ultimately are those really uh, expensive uh, streets and drainage and um, affordable housing and health-related issues for that neighborhood. And Mayor, to respond to Director Warwick, I, I concur with that. Uh, I do have some, uh, I have a Ward 6 economic development strategy that that's been developed and worked on with the neighborhood associations and things that, with, including things that they would like to see and some innovative concepts and ideas that would not cost a lot. And that's why I'm asking the question, how do we get something included in the budget? Because everything is what the mayor and the city manager want. What about what we want to see? So that was the purpose of that question. Thank okay, you. I want $1.4 million for my first targeted neighborhood. Can I clarify I want five something million. on the $1.4 million, please? Mayor. I want $5 million, but I'll take what I can get. And, and before um, Director Lenan responds, because uh, she's going to want to share, um, Mr. Moore, can you just briefly uh, discuss kind of bulky items and weed lots, how that is included in the budget? I think we, it wasn't called out, but it's included. But if you can share that, Mr. Moore. I think it actually was in um, the street fund, Sarah, uh, where we were doing the increase. It's in there, but I didn't see a big increase, which we we have a lot of needs out there picking up. So yeah, we do. I'm not saying it wasn't in there. I'm just saying in order to get the, the neighborhood square where they look good and they have all the things removed from the neighborhood that shouldn't be there, um, you know, it doesn't seem that there's that big of increase in those items to take care of it. One of the things uh, this year, uh, we added about a $100,000 pilot project on hauling. Uh, we finally got a contractor on board. Uh, so he's working and we need to, um, Mr. Honeywell, we'll get him to sort of do an update on how that's working. Uh, but that's totally concentrated on bulky items, uh, things that are on the, in the right of way. Um, adding another right-of-way maintenance crew. Um, so we didn't necessarily put the dollar amount, but it was it, it was a, an, an enhancement over what we were currently doing. And then also just board members, just to just remind board members that we predicate these increases based on the funds. Um, much of these dollars are based on street funds that are coming in from the gas tax. Uh, and so I just want to make sure we're clear that those are dollars that are coming in that we have to then budget around. So, well, Mayor, that, that was the clarification I want to make. Yeah. When you see on the net income the $1.4 million, like the, fun, the funds from that parking garage debt service, that is, that's not available for expenditure. That's dedicated to those bonds. That has to stay in the debt service or in the parking garage fund. Street funds can only be used for streets, drainage, trails, right-of-way. We did set aside the additional 400000 for the right-of-way program that um, Mr. Moore referred to, and that's part of the, the maintenance that enhancement that he was talking about. Um, but the reason you have the separate funds is there are restrictions on those revenues for those funds. Um, for the larger capital-type projects, that's what I was trying to point out at the beginning of the presentation, that with the loss of the $0.38 cent dedicated capital tax, that was the only dedicated capital funding that we have had other than bond issues. And our bond funds are also expiring. 
So some of the projects that would qualify for bond funds, those are things that we need to think about if we were to try to renew a millage to take out additional bonds. And, and when you do those types of things, it doesn't, it can be all street and drainage or like back in 2004, I think when you had a bond issue, a bond issue you had separate titles for different things um, and you can do that as well. But those are things that those capital sources of funding go away at the end of the year. So we have limited capacity to do that without major reductions. I get it, I understand it, thank you. I get it as well, but when, instead of me looking at increasing staffing, I would like to see that, st that staffing in the neighborhood to clean it up, uh, because a lot of the problem that we have is a lack of consistency. I mean, if you get something picked up, well, it may take you a month to get it picked up, if not longer. And then stuff is right back out there, or more stuff is piled up, and there's just no consistency. So the neighborhood always looks junky, it look, always looks littered, and, you know, stuff is always overgrown, and it's just, no, there's just no consistency. And that's what the community residents complain about, because uh, I, they see, you know, a lot of city staff, they see all these new trucks, and there's nothing going on on the ground in the neighborhood where they can visually impact and see what's going on at their house. I mean, we can have all the equity meetings that we want, but if I'm looking at litter every time I pull out of my driveway, I, I'm just, that just don't interest me. Director Richardson. Yes, Mayor. Um, Director Miller, there was a resolution passed and this was part of an unsuccessful sales tax campaign. And rather than talk about war specific needs, which will create war politics, which ultimately validates the reason why some say we need at large directors, it could be as simple as that committee that, that Director Ryark is a part of identifying a particular issue we want to address during one particular one year period, two year period, three years period. Those wards were not picked or chosen arbitrarily. Arbitrarily, Those wards have some common denominators. There are some things that are, make, that, that are common in those wards that produce some of the social ills that are producing some of the crime in our community. So they weren't picked arbitrarily. Oh, I keep having trouble with that word tonight. Um, it was based on certain conditions, whether it was infrastructure, whether it was housing, whether it was employment or unemployment or underemployment, whether it was streets or drains, there are particular things, uh, Director Miller, that, that your ward has, has in common with mine and, and Director Rocks and Director White's uh, ward. So I think that's one of the reasons why we chose those wards and looked at those wards because of those commonalities and to keep this from devolving devolving into a ward politics because each one of us can have a specific need that we can identify for our ward. And that's why we decided to have this committee to address one particular area at a time. And the funding can be from as simple as partnering with a nonprofit that uses a commitment of, of some of these funds for match for that nonprofit to attract foundation funding that address these issues and areas that we're talking about because there are national federal foundations that are, are addressing some of the things that we're talking about doing and we can use part of that money uh, committed from the city as match money to attract or layer federal money in here, foundation money in here. So it wasn't just an issue of these wars were arbitrarily, arbitrarily Pick that they we had common denominators in in those wars and and Doris may have something that she may want and B J just said she has something she wanted and I may have some I want uh, that's war politics and I think that validates um, the reason why people say we need to have at large directors so we have a committee and a group to we would identify to do that address that and help us work with our city staff to address the funding to support those issues identified in the criteria for us having those areas identified as um, in need of uh, targeted financing, targeted funding. So while a resolution was passed, and it was just a resolution, it's an intent, the resolution with no commitment of funding, uh, and the commitment of funding came through an unsuccessful sales tax 
campaign that we had, the commitment of funding to do the work that we outlined in the resolution. I think we need to understand, uh, Director Miller, what you heard was was somewhat true. And the other part of what you heard was somebody uh, obviously being hopefully optimistic that we were going to have some funding from uh, uh, the passage of a sales tax. Thank you. Thank you. That helps a lot because I, I know people are meeting. Uh, I've heard about meetings. It seems people are excited. They think some of the stuff is going to get done. And I think there are some realities probably that uh, people need to face when it comes to dealing with a resolution, which is just an intent, as I guess Director Richardson said. So I, I, I just want some clarification in my own mind. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from members of the board? If not, uh, as Director Wyatt. I just want to make one more comment. Uh, there are going to be two other meetings, and Doris probably knows when hers is. Uh, what? December 9th? December, sorry. December 9th. Yeah, and they'll have one in Ward 1. And these are to meet with the individuals in those particular areas and determine what it is they want to work on. You know, what areas of the city, what needs do they have, this kind of thing. So Director, it's a Director Wyrick. Holistic, it's a holistic approach to uh, trying to understand what these, uh, what these neighborhoods would actually want. I mean, I can drive through and I can see this and that and something else, but... You know, what did they really want us to work on? And where, where, did, they, where, where did they see their needs as being? But uh, in reality, there's not allocated funds for it, but we're not letting that deter us. We're, we're going to go ahead and come up with a plan in each one of the areas. And we may come to a point, as Ken was saying, where it's everybody's got this widget that they want to work on. And so then we bring the board together and focus them on, we need money for this, or we need some kind of resources for this. It's still, it's still early. We've had uh, three meetings, and we're just now getting to the community to talk to them about what their desires are. And I apologize, December 9th is the Equity and Inclusion Lab. It's not, it's not the TCDI meeting. So there's no meeting scheduled for Ward 6, to my knowledge. No. Okay. So, so this is a part of that, that meeting. Okay. Yeah. I just, I know there's an equity lab on December the 9th. But this revitalization in the neighborhoods is a part of that. Okay. And then they're going to have tours as well. Right. The neighborhoods. Those are not scheduled yet. Thanks. Any more questions? All right, as we shared, we want to uh, thank uh, Director Linehan for going through this process with us. If, um, we definitely want to have answer any questions in regards to this balanced budget. We're happy that we've been able to propose a balanced budget with across-the-board raises for all employees, as well as uh, continuing step and grade increases for our officers. Uh, we're still in negotiations with our officers in regards to their increase. We did notate that there will be an additional increase uh, to police command to address uh, compression. Um, and so we're excited uh, that we're able to also propose, a, uh, uh, this is the first time we've been able to do raises since 2017 for, for non-uniform. Uh, and, and we're excited about that and as well as with, with uniform. Um, wanna, once again, thank you, Director Linehan and the entire finance team uh, members of the board, if you have questions, please direct those questions uh, to um, Mr. Moore, um, Sarah, and myself, and we'll try to make sure we get that to you as quickly as possible. And responses, I know um, Director Adcock is going to have a uh, sit down or a phone call with, with Sarah to address some of her questions, so it's not a lot of back and forth uh, to kind of expedite that, Director Adcock. Um, so we want to make sure again when to go through this process with both the expenditures and the revenues, have everyone have a good chance to look at it. Well, if you have more questions, let us know. Uh, and then we hope to present um, an ordinance uh, sometime before the last available date uh, for this passage. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll now move forward to get the agenda. <laughs> Director Miller. I was looking at this presentation. You no, know, that's going to be on uh, next Tuesday. Next week. Yeah, we're, we'll we'll read. So when you, so when it says a proclamation, Director Miller, uh, we won't do it. We'll do it in a business meeting. Um, we see the the deferral for item number seven. Any questions for the consent agenda one through seven? Director Wright. Item number four, Mayor. Is anybody from uh, our housing staff here? Yes. Um, I saw Ms. Shine. Earlier. Is Director Howard here? Are you? Can you? Can you go get them for us, please? <laughs> Mr. Howard. Mr. Howard. Yes, ma'am. Uh, orient me on these lots, and then I have a question for you on some other lots. Okay. So we have uh, 14 lots at uh, 29th and Zion Street that uh, we're purchasing using Home Investment Partnership Program funds. Uh, this is a part of uh, um, lots that we'll be purchasing to do new construction, affordable housing uh, in Ward 6. Uh, we also will be using uh, some of the uh, ARP funds uh, for uh, infrastructure uh, in this area. And this is uh, just south of 28th Street. It, there are some new constructions that BCD developed uh, right off of 28th and Zion uh, right before you get to 29th Street. So currently there's no streets uh, located on those two blocks uh, between uh, Zion Street and uh, 29th Street, and it goes down to 30th Street. Okay. Um, I appreciate the effort, and I, I applaud it, and I was uh, privileged to attend a um, um, press conference today for uh, in affordable housing and their projects that they just got funded and uh, they expressed an interest in working in that area. So I was hoping that this would be something that they would jump on. But I wanted to ask about the vacant lots that are uh, off of Walker Street in that area, in that part of portion of Zion Street. There's some lots in there uh, that I know are for sale. Yes, we do. Um, we currently have an offer in to purchase uh, the, the uh, lots. I know you, we met before on uh, the property on Zion Street that uh, one of the relatives in the area that we met with, we do have an offer in on those four, four lots too at, uh, I believe, 37 and, and Zion Street. Okay. So we'll do infrastructure project there too as well with new construction, affordable housing. Okay, and I know there should be a couple more that should be facing Walker or, or off of... 37th in there is just kind of weird the way the houses are because it looks like they are on two or three lots and sometimes they are but I just wanted to make sure that you were still pursuing that yes and uh, I did meet with as I said in affordable housing today and they were they were very excited about the possibility and they said that they bought about five lots so are theirs anywhere in the vicinity of this? Uh, not in the vicinity of the, uh, right there, but they do have uh, three um, affordable housing units that they'll be constructing that we provided uh, some funding to them under our Home Investment Partnership Program funds. And they would have an opportunity to develop on those lots once we uh, get the infrastructure put in on the uh, 14 lots on Zion and 29th Street. And uh, Mayor, Mr. Moore, uh, I would like, uh, once we get ready to get started, if we could have a press event on that, because the neighborhood needs some encouraging news to see something positive happening. Uh, every time uh, we hear anything about our area lately, it's been somebody got shot or something got robbed or 
that kind of stuff. So this is something very positive. Uh, single family residential homes are what people want to see. And uh, in affordable housing is a housing counseling service. So uh, people can buy these homes. And as I recall, in the past, whenever you've developed them, they've sold pretty quick. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So I would just like to see us make, just get some positive energy out of this and excitement brewing in the neighborhood to see something new going in. Yes, ma'am, and we're planning to do a press conference too, and we definitely make sure we you invite you. Want to invite you. me? Yes, ma'am. We'll okay, make sure you're I'll there. be there. <laughs> and, Thank you. And, and I'll, I'll say this, even though we don't um, we don't have it titled this way, but um, this is, I think, a perfect example of targeted community development. When we get 14 lots uh, concentrated, that's exactly what we want to see. Well, it surely would if I had known about it. <laughs> You couldn't get a lot of, that's one of the problems that I have. Y'all don't tell us anything until we see it on the agenda. So it would have been helpful to know that because I agree, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, infield housing, single family residential. Nobody's gonna jump up and down and call me and uh, chew me out because something's going in their neighborhood they don't like. Everybody likes single family. So this is a win-win, I think. I'll take the blame for that director right on that. I know I didn't, we, we were supposed to speak one day and then we didn't get a chance to talk, so. I and, forgive you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mayor, real briefly, um, arbitrary, that's it. Um, Bruce, to your point about that being a form, a form of targeting, I think you make a good point. I think our NSP1, NSP2 dollars that we don't have anymore, was a greater form of, was the ultimate form of targeted financing. Um, we had partnerships, I think, with BCD, Habitat for Humanity, and University of UA District Partnership. And you know, Mayor Stoll and I had real big disagreements about the commitment of funding in those underserved areas. He said that was proof positive that we were doing targeted financing and funding. We couldn't use those dollars anywhere else but in those areas based on a certain set of criteria, which um, really, really justifies us picking the areas that we're picking for targeted finance. And we couldn't use an SP1 or $2 anywhere else outside the areas that we use those. So Bruce, I, uh, I echo that and I raise, your, raise you one with the NSP1 and two funding that we had at the federal level um, version, which is what I was talking about earlier. Thank you so much, Director Richardson. Thank you, Director Howard. Any questions on item number eight? Um, items eight through 14. Mayor, I do. Director Adcock. Yes. On item 14, I would like to have Mr. Collins answer a couple questions, please. And Director Collins. If someone could go get Director Collins. Mayor, also, uh, I think each board member received this uh, information on this item. Um, the gentleman, the applicant, is here to speak on it. Um, Juan has done a lot in the community in Southwest Little Rock. He also was the person that, with the Little Rock Police Department, did the community cooking classes, which was uh, teaching youth how to cook. And there's several pictures here on their graduation uh, when they finished their classes. Mr. Collins, the way I understand this, this is not a new club. This is just asking, they're open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And this is just asking for three more hours a week. Is that what it is? That is correct. Okay, it's existing and operational. That, please. Yeah, what they're proposing is just to extend their current hours of operation. There's no changes to the existing building itself or any of the layouts. Uh, they only propose changes to allow the sale of the alcoholic beverages until 2 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday, a total of three hours over a two-day time frame. And that's in this present to the ABC. They're requesting that this come before the board as a uh, ordinance adoption. Um, 
I know one night he closed, all three nights he closes at a different time. And yes. he's just interested in being able to say, I'm open from this time to that time. He yeah. has made, in getting this application ready, he has made a lots of a cleanup on that location and painting and fixing up and everything. Yeah, we were support of that. And then uh, the planning commission uh, voted 10 eyes for it uh, to come before the board. Okay. But Mayor, I just wanted the board to know that it's just having three more hours of operation. They're open on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yes, okay. ma'am. Would Mr. Warren like to are you asking? Well, I guess he can speak during the agenda meeting. You mean during the city board meeting? Yeah. Next week. Yeah. 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 The applicant is here if he would like to come up and introduce himself to the board. He can't speak during the, the agenda meeting, Director Adcock, but he, we welcome him to come. If you would like to share an email with the board this week, please do that. And, but you will have opportunity to speak during the city board meeting next Tuesday. And, and welcome. Thank you. And that will give those who may not support this opportunity to speak as well. Yes, okay. sir. Notated uh, as well as Director Richardson. Any questions for items 15 through 22? Mayor. Director Wright. I have a question. I'd like to know uh, a presentation on item 18. Is there anyone here that can speak to that, Mr. Moore? Yes, Dr. Barth is here. Um, I believe, uh, as well as Ms. Doucette, Director Doucette. Good evening, everybody. Um, Director Wright, um, on, um, on item 18, this is um, um, a grant-funded um, project. It's funded by the Wingate Foundation. Um, the Wingate Foundation, I reached out to them soon after I came into this role um, as, as um, a chief education officer, and we began to get clarity that there is a tremendous interest in arts-oriented um, after-school programming across the community schools as we were doing the needs assessment. Uh, we reached the Wingate Foundation, as you know, obviously a very generous foundation that has done a lot of work in the area of, of arts enrichment and a lot of uh, work in the area of, of, um, of education, uh, especially in, in, uh, for low-income uh, communities. And so um, over the years, the Wingate Foundation has worked closely with Arkansas A+, Plus, which was an organization that used to be based at the Thea Foundation in North Little Rock has now moved to the University of Arkansas. Um, the, uh, the Wingate Foundation leadership asked us to visit about a potential partnership there, about whether there could be a partnership, and that began a, a several month conversation with the leadership of Arkansas A+. And um, ultimately we came to a proposal to try a three-year pilot um, that would um, allow uh, eight weeks of um, after-school programming um, at each of the community schools um, in four different areas of the arts, uh, the visual arts, theater and dance, music, and media arts, including podcasting. And um, so this, um, that will, uh, it of course should have begun this fall, but because of COVID and the limitations on uh, folks coming into the school, schools this fall, uh, we decided to push it to um, try it in one school uh, in the spring, and we're in conversations to do that at Watson Elementary. And then uh, it would go to all four schools, and if there is an additional elementary added as a community school uh, through some other grant funding, then it would pick up at that fifth school. Um, and so um, the, uh, the Wingate Foundation uh, could have made the grant in two sections, one to Arkansas A plus and one to us. They wish to kind of make one single grant uh, to us and then allow uh, the subaward to um, uh, to Arkansas A plus. Um, and so that is what's before you is that that subaward. Um, it has gone to the Commission on Children, Youth, and Families. They felt we had a good conversation about it, and they felt very comfortable with uh, with the uh, with the subaward because of 
uh, the ability of Arkansas A-plus to do such a variety of areas of the arts and the capacity that they had to cover so many schools uh, in, one, um, in one fell swoop. So this is all PIT funding? It is, no, it is totally grant funded, uh, totally independent. There is no city funding that is involved here. It is Why are we having to vote on it? Mr. Moore. Uh, the city is the recipient, uh, the conduit, I guess, uh, is a better word. Um, so the, the, the foundation is, uh, is giving the money to the city and uh, because of the amount, uh, the board has to authorize me to enter into a contract with the, uh, with Arkansas A Plus uh, to initiate the program. But we're, there's no city money involved, it's just that we were the grant recipient in order, in order since it's now in our coffers, in order to disperse it, we, ha we have to have board approval. So why would our Children, Youth, and Families Commission have to approve it? I think it was more of a kind of giving them heads up on. Uh, that's that's why I'm confused because that commission was put in place to oversee our PIT. So when you list uh, Children, Youth, and Families Commission as having reviewed this, then that tells me this is four hundred ninety six five thousand dollars in PIT money. Well, the other thing uh, that we we need to remember is that. The CYF does have money into the community schools model, uh, not this particular program, but they are funding it uh, uh, again this year. So anything doing with the community schools model, I, I think it's appropriate to keep them abreast. So if I wanted to get a STEM project approved for J Fair and West Central, I can submit that to the Children's Youth and Families Commission? Uh, yes, ma'am. I don't, you know, I don't know at this point where all their funding is allocated, but uh, that would be the, the, the venue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barf. Thank you. Any other yeah. questions? Just real quickly, again, that, to your point, Bruce, approval of, of funding through CYF before uh, and used to be Task Force for the Prevention of Youth Violence, I could see the necessity for this having to come and what, what the word says, it says endorse, not approve. If you look at the, the wording and the language. So why do we have to go and be endorsed? It's a because it's a grant that's coming to the city. The city is a recipient. And the, Bruce, I don't know, Bruce and Tom, we're not, I don't want to get in that. What you, I, I have just one, one, one question. <laughs> who's going to do the evaluation of it? And how, how often will it be evaluated? Who, who's the intermediary? Who's doing the evaluation to say this is something that's, that we should be doing uh, and replicating and expanding it on? So the, um, there's a separate uh, independent entity at the U of University of Arkansas that will do uh, an assessment on an annual basis throughout the program and then a, a big assessment at the end. And the Wingate Foundation takes um, evaluation super seriously in its grants as they consider the possibility of future uh, granting. So that's built into the model as well. So it's because it is a foundation, you say Wingate, this could potentially be more than three years if in fact we are successful and creative and innovative. It could be something that's, that comes to the city for more than three years and more than $476,000, I think it said. Right. Whether it's from Wingate or some other funding entity. Some other foundation, exactly. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I believe Director Peck. It's on another item. I believe we are. Any more questions in regards with Dr. Barr, Director Adcock? Did you have a question, with Director Adcock? Hold on, Dr. Barr, hold on one second. Yes, I've got several questions. Regarding this particular item? No. Okay. Regarding 16. Yes, ma'am. So we'll go. Thank you, Dr. Barr. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll now, Director Peck. Yes, I went into the presentation on item 19. Item 19, Director Collins. Uh, Director Adcock, what, what question, just so we're. Okay, on number 16, someone needs to tell me what a pedicab saw. A little bicycle uh, with a cart, and, and have you ever seen those? A little cart on a bicycle. A little cart Somebody on cycling a bicycle. and pedaling and taking. Okay, and out. why do we need these? I mean, we've got those scooters sitting all over town now. 
It won't be a so scooter. What purpose do these uh, bicycles do? They're not just bicycles. They're more or less bars on wheels that will go up and down entertainment districts. I can't districts. understand you, Tom. They're essentially bars on wheels that will go up and down entertainment districts. Fayetteville has them, and evidently it's working well in Fayetteville. They beat Mississippi State last week. Okay, item number 15, Mayor, I'd like to show the pictures so that the public will know which houses we're looking at. Demolishing, please. Yes, ma'am. If staff will prepare those pictures as uh, Director Collins, will you, I know it's going to take a little time to get those pictures together. Can you go through Director Pecks and then we'll, once you get done, we'll go immediately to Director Adcock with those pictures. Yes, sir. Um, item 19 uh, is the uh, come and go that is at the intersection of Shin and Cho and uh, Highway 10. It is on the southeast corner. Uh, the property is uh, proposed to be 1.51 acres. Uh, currently, the zoning is C3. Uh, the reason that it is before the board uh, today, uh, it is uh, because of the acreage. It is uh, less than two acres. And within the Highway 10 Design Overlay District, uh, any variance at that level, uh, it puts it before the board as a planned development. Uh, besides for that, the C3 use does allow uh, for a convenience store with uh, gas pumps in that current zoning. Uh, and as described uh, before it was deferred to this meeting, there has been opposition uh, that uh, against the development at that location. I believe the last time uh, that the board discussed this, a question was raised and deferred so that they can meet with the neighborhoods uh, and also the Architectural Control Committee. I believe that the developer has spoke with uh, the Architectural Control Committee uh, for Chanel Valley, but I do not believe that they had an official meeting or that the board has received an official letter from them in support of it. The, the site plan, and if you could bring up the, it might be plan two, number two that's on there, uh, I received that uh, at the day of the meeting uh, prior to the deferral. Um, a lot of the questions, and if we could zoom in to probably that uh, western side on the Shenan Show side, that was a primary reason uh, for some of the opposition, which was the uh, dedicated left turn movement. Uh, that is a requirement at that intersection pursuant to the master street plan. Uh, what they're proposing now is the left turn movement to stay the same. So no removal of that center island and there'll be an additional uh, right turn lane that will be added to the east side of that intersection. And that is that darker area that you see. And in doing so, and also trying to accommodate for a larger setback on the Shin and Chow side, uh, the site plan had shifted a little bit to the east and there was a reduction of parking of about three stalls. And that was a question that was raised uh, in our last meeting. Uh, would this be considered uh, a change that was enough to put it back to the Planning Commission? I do not believe so because it's not an increased intensity, it's just a shift in the layout or the, the entire building and the site layout, uh, but not a orientation, change orientation or change in our operation. Uh, if we could zoom south or down a little bit. Um, so the entrance on the south side is the same. Now there is going to have to be just some minor modifications to the center island at that location. It's not really meant to have somebody that's coming southbound on Chinonshaw wanting to turn left or east into the site. Uh, so we'll have to accommodate that uh, in this construction. But it should, it, before we had, they had proposed a full left-hand turn lane in there uh, would reduce the island and take it into the site. So that has been removed. So still currently, this is the current site plan that it is, has presented uh, by the applicant to us uh, for this. And that, that'll be the site plan that y'all will be voting on uh, next week. So as it stands, the Planning Commission uh, did approve uh, this, there was six uh, votes for, three votes against, one was absent, and there was one open position on the Planning Commission. 
and there were several that spoke um, uh, at the commission uh, and just addressed the commission and some of their concerns. And I'm sure that the board through the emails have seen other concerns of the citizens in the area, uh, primarily um, some of the potential noise, traffic generation. And then I talked about that at the last meeting. Um, typically a gas station chain is not a destination. It does not generate traffic. People go to that to and from their location uh, on it, uh, as opposed to something as Costco, that's typically a traffic generation. People will drive from outside the city uh, to come to that location. Uh, so it's a capture location. It's capturing the traffic that's off the roadway. Uh, potentially, could there be somebody that's going to another gas station down the road, come to this gas station and increase some traffic uh, close to the intersection, that's a possibility. But if you're asking at some point in time if traffic is be added or generated to Cantrell, I do not believe that the Cantrell as a whole, this development is a add to the traffic generated on Cantrell. It is a capture from the traffic that is already on Cantrell. Uh, so with that, I'm welcome to answer any questions that the board may have. Mayor, I have a question. Vice Mayor Hines. J Jamie, don't, don't I hear you say, did the uh, applicant, have they submitted anything in reduction of hours of service? We have not received anything to date. Because I know that was something that they were, that, that part of the deferral was the neighborhoods were talking to, uh, some representatives from the neighborhoods were talking to come and go about that. So I haven't heard anything either. So uh, we'll keep you posted. But I do think you're correct that the new site plan where they've moved the turn lanes onto their own property and got the setbacks, I think that Potlatch Delta, because uh, I it don't is. think it's officially been to their to their architectural control committee, but I think they said they're comfortable with this. And so the underlying, underlying zoning here is C3, correct? That is correct. Okay, so this would be an allowed use in C3? Yes, it would be allowed use in C3. Thanks. And but there the was reason. a question, um, that was raised uh, prior to the meeting. Uh, it was uh, a little bit hard to see from our zoning map of where that, uh, we do our exhibits based on zoning. And there were several uh, adjacent property owners that uh, thought the come and go was going directly to the west of them. Uh, but in actuality, it only is adjacent to one lot in the adjacent subdivision that's to the southeast of them. Uh, although that remainder tract is C3 and potentially have C3 uses adjacent to that uh, residential development, uh, this one really is only adjacent to right there at that corner of that subdivision. It is not adjacent to and fully along the side of that subdivision. Okay. And then, uh, I forgot where I was going to go. So, and, and part of the reason we're in this process is the Highway 10 DOD and this site is less than two acres, correct? That's what that's, we're That's correct. The existing lot line is greater than two acres. And what they're looking to do as part of the sale of this property is adjust the lot line back to the north, uh, specifically for this use, uh, which puts it underneath that acreage. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Direct, I'm, Director Pick, you're fine. Thank you. Director Wyrick. You're gonna have to go over a couple of things with me again. Um, well, the map went away. Um, there we go. The west side uh, at the back of the um, location, I see a little median there. Is that going to be built by the developer? I think it's a median. See that little gray thing right there? Yes. And there's also another development that is also coming to the west side of that, uh, that that uh, intersection right there also has to accommodate some turning movements there. And so uh, that specific alignment right now, because now it's going to have to accommodate that was going to be a dedicated left turn movement going south on Shannon Show that's going to turn into this site. That would have been in conflict with that island, that little darker area that you're talking about. And that's what I was explaining that that's going to have to be relooked at, you know, if approved and this development goes, that that intersection is still going to have to accommodate that left turn movement into the site. 
And so the island as a whole, that north island, the larger island, won't have a left turn movement that will be inside of it and taking out the, the median, but we'll have to accommodate those little um, uh, curves and minor curves right there to allow that to be in. So there will be some minor modification median of that intersection. Hanging out. That little, that, that small median, that's a portion of it may need to be removed, but the median's not gonna be took out. Okay, now can they still, I'm slow, can they still turn uh, south out of this development? South on Shenandoah? Yes, currently they can still turn south to go on Shenandoah. Okay, you say currently? Yes. In the future? In the future, it would, they need to have full access there, so yes, they need to turn south. Okay. Okay. And on the um, east side, there's a subdivision that's east of there, which I'm hearing a lot from. Um, what is the distance to that uh, subdivision? If we could pull up the zoning map, uh, that would probably be... Well, before we leave this, can I... Uh, okay. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, uh, is this a new access road to go on to Highway 10 on the east side? The, the, the furthest one to the east? Yeah. Is that, a new, is that a new access road to the development? No, that is existing. That's existing, okay. Yes. Now, at this, at this intersection to Highway 10, can they go left and right? Yes. They can? Okay. Uh, but, it, uh, but keep in mind that uh, in the future improvements that when Arkansas Department of Transportation comes in, their standard design is for a highway of this level of service has a concrete divided median down through there to be uh, separated or broke up at major intersections. So I can't speak for which intersections they would break that median for. Will not probably be the east one. It'd be Shenan Show would be the lighted, you know, signalized intersection. And during traffic scenario, typically that type of intersection is restricted upon itself because it's they won't be able to make the turning movement. It'd be difficult to do that, but yes. But there's not a sign or anything that restricts them from making a left. Currently, right now, there's not. Okay. All right. And uh, the the land next to this development, east of this development, did you say it was already zoned C three? Uh, the south of this development. Okay. Uh, that was part of that C three zoning, and that was a clarification that was asked of us of uh, was that part of that property and the that was a development that come in so that development goes south to the east how what is that zoned the uh, spring up you at the zoning map there's a mix of zoning in that area there's no zoning map you're going to go to the land use for some reason the posting's not correct the land use will have the map But there you can see the good picture of where the neighborhood is. Uh, the guy says to the southeast of them. And then that's an office uh, development. And I believe that one's a planned office development. I'll pull it up. I'll see if I can find it real quick. Well, it looks like they've got an O in that whole parcel there. It is. It's a planned office development directly to the uh, the east. And then there's a, uh, and a split by PCD in the middle. Uh, they come in and wanted to redo a tract, a building that's in there. So where that O is has a POD uh, and a PCD in it, planned commercial development and planned office development. It's fully built out. Yes. The only area that's, that's not built out is if you'll land next to it but yeah the vacant land as you see is to the south you'll see where the red is the hatched area that is where the development is proposing the uh, building just to the south is, is existing and then the reindeer where it's C down below it 
that is uh, commercial. That is still all C3. It changes over to O2 where you see the O down below, that is O2. So the, the, the residential neighborhood, Chavot, that is right to the east of this, uh, this development is not directly right there. Uh, but it has also been planned and approved to have C3 uses adjacent to that development. See that, okay. So what's the distance from this new development to the subdivision? I'll have to measure that. I don't have it. I think it's about 200 feet, but I just wondered if you knew what it was. I'll get that measurement, send it out to everybody. Thank you. Director Adcock. Um, yes, Mayor, I have a real problem with 21 and 22. It seems like that Director Antoine Phillips has decided to split what he was trying to do into 21 and 22. 21 would say that the at-large boards of directors would have to stand for election again in 2022 to become a regional district. And then 22 uh, talks about that the mayor would fire and hire the city attorney and Bruce Moore. So it seems like that he took what he was trying to do in changing the form of government and made it into 21 to get rid of the at-large directors and go to regional directors, and in 22, to fire Mr. Moore and Mr. Um, Carpenter. So do you know why we are now seeing this divided into two ordinances instead of the one ordinance that we had tabled and was going to look at again tonight? Uh, no, ma'am. Mr. Moore? I believe um, he passed out a packet to everyone last week, and these were two ordinances that were in the packet. They, they, these were, um, they, these were two. He talked about both concepts, but there were actually two separate ordinances that he passed out in in everybody's packet. Mr. Carpenter. Uh, reading this number 21, it states that we with the at-large directors, which is Dr. Compeers, uh, Director Phillips, and myself, would have to run for re-election again in 2022. Is that correct? I thought that it read that, that your term would end from your last election, and then at the next election, you would be able to run for a regional director's position. Well, that would be 2024. I thought that's what it said. I, I was uh, looking, and, and Director Adcock, both of those ordinances were presented to the board in 2020 uh, as a result of the committee that Mr. Campbell had chaired. Uh, but before a vote was taken, they were pulled down. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I... Yeah. Thank you, um, Mr. Attorney, Vice Mayor Hines. So uh, I just wanted to make a comment. So ordinance number 20 is a clarification uh, of our policy, essentially policy and procedure where uh, the city manager spending authority is concerned. And if we have any future uh, lawsuit settlements, the procedure that will be followed so that it is crystal clear as to what that execution will be. I think the key component to that being, as I pull up the ordinance, um, that prior to uh, section three, uh, it says prior to the settlement of any litigation which the city or an employer or other person hired by the city as party, the city attorney or his authorized representative shall inform each member of the board of directors, including the mayor of the nature of the litigation, the nature of any proposed settlement and the right to discuss potential settlement in a public meeting, provided that all such determination shall be conducted in accordance with the Arkansas Freedom of Information Act. So that covers us, uh, uh, and is binding on how we will hopefully not uh, get into the situation we're in uh, on the uh, settlement of the Blackshire case. Uh, and uh, 
Tom scripted this, so I think we have pretty good judgment that it's it's legal and binding, and it's got a reverter clause on it as well. Any questions? Director Adcock, you, is your hand still up? Oh. That's all. My hand's up. Director Wright? Yes. Mayor, I uh, have been keeping you all abreast of, of a situation I have in Ward 6 on Dover Drive. And uh, Mr. Carpenter uh, has reviewed uh, our 2015 uh, action that we took to uh, uh, revoke the PC PUD, and he has rendered an opinion. And I would like him to address uh, that to the board, and uh, there, that way we will know where we stand with that. Mr. Carpenter. Uh, the memorandum, and I, I'm everybody should have had a copy of it, mm -hmm. essentially said that the property um, meant several years ago had been rezoned from R2 to MF18, and then it had been uh, set up as a planned development. The planned development was not done. Um, an extension was granted, and then there was a, to be the uh, Arkansas Hospice Plan development that is what they were asking uh, to be removed, the planned development aspect of it. And um, the reason was because they were gonna create senior housing. And uh, they offered two conditions on the night that the ordinance passed. They wrote them, they put them in there. At one point in the tape, it was mentioned that the conditions were a part of the application, which means when uh, we do this otherwise, when they're in the zoning file from planning, they become binding. And the opinion concludes then that because there's no limitation as to what ad the financing they would get or when, then uh, is they're building a um, senior housing facility there on Dover Drive, uh, that's fine. If they're not, then um, they need to be told that that's what they've got to do. I don't think they agree with that. The information is provided to the planning department, and I understand they're going to contact the owner, developer, or applicant. <coughs> so to be clear, our planning department will be making contact with the uh, applicant and and or developer. Whoever has saying. the building permit. And let him know that his building permit has to be for senior housing and not just for any type multifamily, right. which is what he said he would do in 2015, and we can hold him to that. Okay. Now, thank you for that. I'm sure the community would be very grateful. But I do have a couple of other things, Mayor, that came up as I plow through this process. I wanted to make the board aware that uh, as, as I was made aware of our 2003 resolution requiring notification when tax credit applications come to the city, well, we learned through this process that ADFA has removed that as a requirement for the applicant to notify the city. But uh, working with our state representative, he's working with ADFA to uh, notify state officials. So they can at least notify us, but we need to amend our 2003 resolution to state uh, low income tax credits as well as uh, any other type of ad for funding, which it does not, it's not clear in there. And so that was one of the things that uh, I was looking at. And I believe that we also need to add in there that we need to be notified as ward directors of any multifamily development that's going in our wards because these developments may create uh, a lot of problems for single family residential neighborhoods. I was talking to our planning department about transition and between uh, the single family and multifamily because as I believe Director Peck said a while back, no single family neighborhood wants multifamily next to them. They just don't want it. There has to be a way that we can minimize the, uh, I consider it just trauma because this thing is, is just been, been crazy. I've been dealing with so many issues with multifamily developments lately and it all comes down to uh, 
transitory living. And a lot of traffic, a lot of noise, uh, single family residential neighborhoods are not comfortable with this. So I think we need to review our zoning codes and we need to make some amendments. Uh, if we could uh, transition between single family and go to uh, a less like neighborhood commercial or, or something where it's not just multifamily right next to single family residential because these residents don't want that. And, and they have a legitimate argument, I feel, because they have a 30 year mortgage. They can't pick up and move, but somebody living in an apartment, they can move in six months. But whatever negative is going on there to, with your home, your, the value of your home is determined by what's going on around it. There's just no way around that. Real estate appraisals look at that. And I think that, that we, need to be, we need to find a way to protect our single family residential. And that's what we want. That's why I was so excited when Director of Housing said that he was going to be building single family because that infill is an issue. I have, I've been inundated with uh, duplexes. I get complaints from my residents all the time about the tenants and, you know, it's not regulated and loud music, junk cars, uh, unmaintained uh, yards and not putting in the trash. I mean, it's just a multitude. I'm, I, I mean, I feel these calls all the time, constantly, constantly. So I just feel that we as a board need to take a look at our zoning codes. We need to... Uh, uh, review those and make whatever changes that we can make from, I think, from uh, adding in the low density, anything, that any buffers that we can put between single family and multifamily, I think we need to do that. And we also need to put something in our resolution whereby uh, before any more, any multifamily is built, what else is around it? For instance, in this situation, right down the street and around the corner, I just had a huge development open, and it's all ad for funded. Now you get this one coming in right here beside this stable neighborhood. It's just like my university park. It's an aspirational neighborhood. People want to move there. I mean, when you when you buy a home, that's going up, and you all you still are in a neighbor area that's affordable. And I just don't feel that uh, we are doing enough to protect our neighborhoods, and we got to. And the next thing I want is uh, I sent out to everybody, uh, I want to be notified when there are meetings in my ward. I feel that I should be notified and I'll give you a case in point. I didn't know about this development because it was zone multifamily, there was no trigger that would have allowed planning to contact me to let me know what was going on. But I had a, a constituent in the meeting, neighborhood meeting, had about 30, 40 people there, and she felt that as her ward director, I should have personally sent a letter to every single person in that neighborhood. Well, you all, we know that's impossible for me to do, because first of all, I don't know them all. Second of all, uh, that would be our planning department that would be notifying them. And I can't notify you of something that I don't even know about. So any multifamily developments that develop that, that are proposed in my ward, I would like to know about. However we get that accomplished, Mayor Scott and Mr. Moore, I don't know, but I would like to know, and I don't care whether it's existing zoning already in place, my constituents expect me to know. They don't expect to have to call the mayor's office to find out. They expect to call the ward director who lived down the street and around the corner. That's why they elected me. So I wanna know so I can uh, let them know, communicate with at least the neighborhood president and let him disseminate information. But in this instance, I knew nothing. So reviewing of the zoning codes, uh, revising our 2003 resolution or amending it, and notification of uh, ward meetings. And I did have a, do have a resolution coming out about that. I sent it out to each of my colleagues. I want you all to weigh in if you have any issues or concerns or questions you want to add to it. I'm dealing with uh, what's impacting me, and I, if you all have anything y'all want to add in there, or if, it, or, if, or if I missed something, let me know. But Mr. Carpenter drew it up, but I did send that out to you all, so you should have a, had a copy. I want you to have a chance to uh, review it before I add it to the agenda. I'm not trying to add it next week, but I do want to get it added in there. So, but I appreciate that, and thank you, Mr. Carpenter for the clarification as to where we stand. And so our zoning staff, our planning staff rather, will be making contact. Is that on tomorrow or when? Because I'm gonna get that question. 
My phone's blowing up over here. When will that take place? Director uh, Wright, I've instructed our planning director to uh, make that confirmation phone call okay. tomorrow. Okay, we, we're doing a phone call. We're not doing anything in writing? Uh, we can do it in writing, but I think it'll be easier to get the person to confirm first via phone. Okay. Director Collins, you want to share? And what your next steps are? And Director Collins, if you also want to share, uh, I'm not privy to what Director Wright was sharing in regards to multifamily notifications. Mm -hmm. Is there a process in place and how, how does that go about? Uh, well, I'll address that after the, the uh, no call tomorrow. And uh, yes, there will be a call made tomorrow to the applicant of the building permit uh, asking them uh, the intent of the occupancy of the building. And uh, if in fact, um, as Mr. Carpenter has explained, their intent is not to build multi, uh, you know, senior living, mm -hmm. then uh, we'll explain them about the building and then we will uh, officially follow up with a letter. Um, uh, we, we do that because if we're going to put on hold or do a building permit, we do need to put paperwork in the file for that and, and get them a copy via certified mail and regular mail. So both of those will happen okay. uh, tomorrow. Now addressing the notification, I believe uh, Mayor, um, uh, Director Wright is correct in one aspect of it. Uh, what, well, I believe what she is speaking about is when a property is zoned correctly, that the what is being built is being built by right. Mm -hmm. uh, we do send out to the ward directors that want notification of any application that comes through the planning commission, whether it goes to the board uh, for a final or as a conditional use permit, uh, they do get a notification uh, sent out to them. This one was a by right. And since it was zoned MF-18, uh, when the application comes in, there is no further review. Uh, and so any zoning, be it commercial, multifamily, office, residential, if it is a by right and no zoning needs to change, either conditional use or uh, permanent zoning, then uh, board members are not notified of a, but it is just a building permit issuance at staff level review. Uh, so that is the current process. And uh, so Director Wright has made me aware of, of her question to change that process, and that is something that uh, we just need to speak about at administrative uh, level and see what we can do to accommodate. Uh, I do not believe that a mass mailing is for any development of that size, if it's a by right, would be advantageous uh, to do that for notifications. Multifamily, uh, because we're also looking at different uh, ways to look at multifamily and where they are put at, uh, that may be something that we need to look at in the future. But I also wanna make the point that there is, and uh, the Mr. Carpenter uh, addressed this point in the previous uh, board meeting, that there are several tracts of land throughout the city that are zoned multifamily some of those have not been developed. Uh, a lot of those has been developed. Uh, when a developer uh, comes to and buys a piece of land that it is currently zoned, uh, that is a buy right zone. So you, so they are buying this knowing that this is a zone that they can develop in. So I, any change that we do, I would uh, just suggest that we get with the city attorney's office and look at it to see how that affects uh, that zoning and what somebody already owns that land and has had it under ownership for potentially years, maybe decades, of what they intend to develop that land as and how that would affect that. Thank you so much. What about notification of multifamily developments, period? Can you, can the planning department notify board directors of any multifamily development that's going into their area? Yes, that can be done at a uh, staff, just a policy change. I would, uh, I would. Just like we, there's nothing in the laws or ordinances that says now that the, the directors are notified right. in their ward of any zoning change, but we go ahead and notify that. So that's just a policy change. That can we need to pass that or is that in-house with your department? That's in-house. We just put it as a policy in there for all notifications for any multifamily coming in any ward that they be notified. Well, all of your staff would know to notify me or any other board member of any multifamily development? Yes, we will put that at the, for 
for the building deal, we'll have to see one. I'm going to see if we can have it incorporated into our system automatically. Yes. So that when the building permit is pulled for multifamily, now I'm assuming we're not going to include uh, triplexes, duplexes. There needs to be a certain number below. No, I'm talking multifamily. Okay. That's not considered a duplex or or triplex. Okay. So, but I think that we can accommodate that. I would like to see it in your uh, application process so something would be triggered so that it would automatically happen because somebody remembering it, somebody could be out, somebody could be filling in, and you know these things can just create a nightmare as you as you saw from that neighborhood meeting. I understand, and uh, we are in the process uh, trying to get the contract signed for some amendments and revisions to our system. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe what we're about to implement with how contractors are notified when something happens to their permit that we could incorporate that. So I think that's what I'm saying. I think that is something that can be incorporated. Okay, I really would appreciate that. And I did send some uh, information to you regarding some of the other changes that I think we need to make. And I think, Mayor, we need to look at our, our zoning codes and try like under C3. I mean, there's a multitude of things that can be developed in that zoning code. Can we not limit that? And, and why is it so broad? So, so uh, Director, I think what may be prudent is um, at an upcoming policy meeting, uh, we have those type of discussions there where you can offer some uh, thoughts and recommendation and then uh, Director Collins can work with me and Mr. Moore. Mm -hmm. uh, we can figure out what best fits because we want to ensure uh, that board members get all the information that they need. And I, I do understand where you're coming from. If it's mm -hmm. something that's by right, technically, they just go ahead and do mm -hmm. it historically. I mean, they did nothing wrong. It's, right. I understand but, that. But, we, but clearly because of some things that have happened, I think it's prudent that you make some changes mm -hmm. as you've shared. Uh, I think will be amenable to that. Thank you. Is there, um, maybe uh, um, I'll give you a phone call soon and try to see if there's anything else we need to make some top policy changes. Okay. So. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And Mr. Carpenter, thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Jane. And just, so are some of those changes and including this resolution, we can just make those policy changes. I, can, uh, I, I sent it to you. Oh, you did, okay. Yes, ma'am. As, as I was working through this, I can put them all together. I don't think I, I don't think I've had a chance to see it, but yeah, but I'll I'll make I'll review that and we'll review it with the director Collins and and we'll, we want to make sure that nothing slips by. And director Peck and I were working on the multifamily that was in her area that was an issue, and I put forward some recommendations as to how to increase notification to the neighborhood. And then this pop up, and I didn't even know about it. So it's notification to me. Offline, because I have some recommendations as well. So okay, good, because we want to put it all together and make one change and let it go into effect January one. This is how this, we're moving. So forward. what I think may be best is if, if I'll call you, mm -hmm. get your feedback. I'll call you, get your feedback. Mm -hmm. We'll take that feedback to Director Collins. We'll see what's workable, feasible, because of other things we may not all know about, uh -huh. that he may know. And then we'll make some policy changes to um, adapt to s s concerns from the board to ensure there's more notification, um, because we know this something has been done historically, but it's time to make it clear there's been some instances where there may needs to be a change. We'll do this, so it may not be a need for the resolution, because we'll right. just make the policy change. Well, and because I, as, as I understand it, some of these zoning codes hadn't changed in 40 years. And that's ridiculous. We're in the 21st century now. We got to look at this stuff. No, I agree. I think we just did a big zoning revision last year, and it hadn't. Those changes hadn't changed since '82, 1982. So look, there's a lot that needs to be changed. So we'll continue to do this. So we'll get the feedback from Directors Peck, Directors Wright. Uh, instead of the resolution, uh, Mr. Carpenter will work with uh, Director of Planning to incorporate those policy changes. Thank you. You can go home now. All right. Any more questions or concerns? Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Moore has a presentation. Sure. And, and to be brief, I know it's been a long night, a long day. Allie, if you'd bring up 
Uh, these are uh, some proposed uh, 2020 uh, ward boundaries um, that um, I would like to this week um, uh, put out on our home page uh, starting uh, by Friday. Um, uh, I've visited with um, all of the uh, ward members, and so they will be up uh, starting Friday, November 12th through the 26th. Uh, citizens will be able to review uh, the new proposed boundaries and make any comments. We'll compile all of the comments um, and then present those to the board uh, by the 30th, which is when the, uh, the direction from the ordinance that was passed or the resolution that was passed um, that uh, the board uh, have some draft boundaries to review by the 30th. So. Um, we attempted to, obviously, we have some prevailing guidelines as far as um, our uh, number that we have to shoot for in each ward. Uh, the median is that the 20, uh, I can't see, 28,941, and you can be plus 5% or minus 5% of that number. Uh, so that was the, our main guiding principle. And then uh, keeping neighborhoods together, uh, there's some natural boundaries, uh, obviously, in our city. Uh, and, and this isn't an easy process. Little Rock is 125 square miles, as you all know. Uh, but I uh, appreciate everyone's work. I appreciate the planning staff uh, and their work, and I uh, look forward to uh, comments uh, from the public uh, and from bo board members. Thank you. Uh, Director Webb, I see your hand. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Moore. Could could we get a copy of that emailed to us? We yes, ma'am. We're gonna get you the, the the this map and plus the individual ward maps. Uh, the staff was working on that this uh, this evening, and we'll get all that out to you tomorrow. Thank you for all the time uh, that you all have spent on this. All right. Any more questions from members of the board? Seeing none, meeting adjourned.